I'm James Baker with the Public Sector Technology, and I want to thank you all for joining us this morning for the critical mobile government forum, Changing the Way California Collaborates. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Public Sector Technology Exchange, we are an independent forum that hosts national discussions on government and technology. You can learn more about us. Uh, there's a web address as well as a links for us there and all kinds of social media. Before we begin today, I want to go over a few housekeeping items with you. Today's event will be recorded and we'll send all registrants a copy of it. If you could kindly put your mobile, tablet, any kind of electronic devices on quiet, uh, and I'm going to make sure I do that too because I'll be the one whose phone's going off during this. Um, also, uh, your questions are welcomed and how our forums go is I'm going to take a few minutes, uh, a little bit of time up front and interview the panelists. And then we're going to have a session where we open it up to you, the audience, to interact with them. And uh, last thing, your feedback is valued. Um, events like this just don't come together, and we want to hear what you think. And if you're able to, at the end of the event, fill out a survey for us, that would be great. Um, when we get to the audience session, I'll bring around a, a wireless mic to you, and you can ask the audience your question. Now, um, before we get started, uh, Last thing I need to go over with you. On your way out, we're happy to validate your parking. You'll get a, in the spirit of Easter, you'll get a green, pink, or yellow sticker. Just put that on your parking uh, tab that you got when you came in, and Scott in the lobby will validate your parking with it. Okay. I'd like to bring up Joel now. Uh, NWN is our sponsor today, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about NWN before we get started. Joel? Thanks, Jimmy. So first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for coming this morning. Uh, it's early. Uh, hopefully you have a cup of coffee and can relax. Uh, and I'd like to make a special thank you to the, to the panel. Uh, thanks. It's uh, taking time out of your day, and it's uh, a valuable time, we realize. So thank you very much. <clears throat> As many of you know, NWN has uh, uh, been around for many years. And when it comes to this collaboration and mobility space, it's something that uh, we feel is very important uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one. Uh, for productivity in the workplace. And number two, for the millennial group that's coming up in the workforce today, it's something that's extremely important because their expectation is very high around collaboration and how they work in the workforce. So we want to be able, from a leadership standpoint, to attract this, uh, these individuals and make sure that we, we head down the road with, with good leadership in the future. So this is two, two, two areas, uh, collaboration and mobility, that I think is extremely important to all of our futures. And uh, so hopefully today you can walk away with a couple of nuggets to go back and, and be excited about and actually take another step down the pike. So with that, Jimmy, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, it's now my pleasure to have our esteemed panel introduce themselves. We'll start with Lena and then we'll just go right down the line. Lena? My name is Lena Luna Pruitt, and I'm the Chief of Infrastructure at the California State Lottery. So I'm responsible for making sure that all of the mobile devices that are in use by our employees connect to our network, and I'm responsible for making sure that our website uh, is available and provides services to uh, our players on, those mobile on their mobile devices and can connect or support our mobile application. Hi, I'm Dr. Rana. Um, I am the special assistant to the Office of the Deputy Director, Camus Division at the Department of Healthcare Services. It's a very long title. Um, so my uh, background is that I am actually a physician that has a technical background. And I made my transition from medical practice to consulting and eventually found my way in the state. So my responsibility at the department is to coordinate across divisions for some of our bigger issues, problems, and make sure that I'm effectuating uh, solutions that make sure that our provider networks stay uh, vibrant and our beneficiaries are being taken care of. Good morning. Um, I'm Joe Panor, and about 45 days ago, I worked for the state as the director of the IT division for Department of Corrections, and I've been retired for about 45 days. And um, it's a good place to be at. Uh, 
But I started up my little IT consulting business, and so I'm ramping that up, and I hope just to stay engaged and give something back to the local IT community. Thank you. Uh, Joel Green, Senior Vice President of NWN. Uh, just as a quick overview, as you guys mostly know, we solve business problems through technology. Uh, I am the over the West uh, Coast office, and specifically uh, in the government space. Good morning, uh, Barney Gomez. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Department of Healthcare Services. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jay Chenier. I'm a, on the City Council for the City of Sacramento. I represent District Five, which is. 22 neighborhoods, um, kind of ranging from very poor to very well off. I also run a consulting company on education issues here in Sacramento. Good morning. My name is Max Wyatt. I'm regional manager for Cisco Systems in Northern California, focused on public sector, local government, and education. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Taylor. I'm the chief over the application development and support area within CalPERS. I'm a direct report to the CIO, Leanna Bailey Crimmins. And uh, I didn't realize Joe had only been retired for 45 days, so I'm hoping you got a check recently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you haven't, let, well, we can talk uh, after the fact. Good morning. I'm Shell Culp. I think many of you remember me as the Agency Information Officer for Health and Human Services Agency and uh, Chief Deputy Director of the Office of Systems Integration. I'm now the, um, uh, I think my title is Chief Innovation Officer for Stewards of Change Institute. I'm not real sure what that means, but since I'm retired, I can be sort of a general pain in the ass um, to, <laughs> to people and, and sort of, you know, try and, and, and spur some innovation. Um, I will uh, uh, just kind of give a plug to NWN uh, and thank them for uh, having us all here to, to, to maybe do some learning about how to be uh, a, a little bit more innovative and, um, and point out that uh, the president of NWN, Dr. Jane Linder, who's a friend of mine, has written a book called Spiral Up uh, about making broad and bold change. And if you haven't read it, I would um, you know, highly suggest you get a copy of that. It is... Uh, a remarkable book that teaches you how to do bold change. I mean, wherever you are in your organization. So I'll just put that plug in. My name is Jason. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of California Highway Patrol. And also want to uh, thank Jim to uh, put this forum together, give us a, a platform to share uh, technology implementation experience and also uh, to learn from each other. Good morning, I'm Rob Schmidt. I'm Agency Information Officer for California Department of Food and Ag and 31 other departments, boards, and commissions. Um, I'm interested in the mobile workforce. So I'll be talking not just about the technology aspect, but the workforce itself. I'm also studying innovation right now at Stanford University um, and learning a lot about how to get teams working together um, from both business and IT. Um, so I'll hopefully uh, have the chance to share that. Thanks. Thank you very much. And also just to note in your program, there's a few changes due to the inclement weather that's facing the East Coast right now. I know we don't deal with that here in Sacramento, but we've had a couple changes in speakers, so just duly note that. We're, what, now what we're going to go into the portion of the program, I'm going to interview our speakers, and then after that I'll open it up to you, the audience, for your question. So we're going to start with Jay. Let's begin, Jay, with why is mobile important to our city here, Sacramento? Thanks. Um, you know, I think that data overall uh, in city government was not meant for normal human beings, um, which is a real problem. You know, I think I'm not even sure it was meant for people who run the city as council people. Uh, so. There's a real challenge for us as people have the ability to access data to make it understandable. And I think as uh, government continues to devolve downward, that um, where we can make the most difference at city government versus the state or the federal government, and as more and more responsibility comes to the city, uh, it's really imperative that we be able to connect with our citizens, with people who live in the various neighborhoods that we represent. So that translates then into, you know, what happens when you put a tax measure on the ballot? What happens when you want to build an arena and you need to really put information out there? All of the things that happen in the city 
are, it's imperative that people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. So what we need to do is really be able to translate data to an understandable format um, to make it accessible. And I think what happens then for the city is that we can really vest people in a vision of the future. Jay, uh, share with us some, uh, some examples of how the city of Sacramento has embraced mobile. So we're doing, we're doing a few things. Um, certainly the city uses Facebook. We use Twitter now. Um, all of the council members are online, seems to me, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you talk to my constituents and see where they're emailing us. But it's a combination of Facebook, Twitter, nextdoor.com uh, has become really big as far as public safety goes in the neighborhoods. And so really trying to get ahead of the curve and understand where we can communicate quickly. Um, I will say that in December when we had the rains and the storms and just last week when we had the big river come through, the atmospheric river, we were really able to talk to people in our neighborhoods to let them know when power outages would be restored, what was happening, where they could go. Um, so I think that's been really important to have real-time information going out about city services. Thank you, Jay. Next question, Barney, could you share with us how mobile and collaboration has impacted the way DHCS does business? Yeah, I mean, um, I think for the most part, what we're doing with at healthcare services is that, you know, our part of our part of our mission is to basically ensure that our our customers, which is the state of California, are, are well informed. To that end, we, uh, we, uh, we've been developing our mobile applications like Every Woman Counts. Uh, we developed a reporting, a report card uh, application for Office of Patient Advocate. And, and our goal really is to make sure that we're getting the information out there about, our, about what's going on with your uh, health care options. It rates, your, uh, rates the HMOs that are out there and the plans that are out there in terms of a scorecard. The Every Woman Counts uh, application is, a, is an application that's really about awareness uh, in terms of uh, breast cancer. So, you know, we are, we, uh, we are continuing to plan and work around what we can do for our customers because we believe that health care services, that our number one goal is to serve the citizens of California. Next question for you is, what are your concerns with mobile? I know, you know, when you're dealing with people's information, security, and other things, what are the concerns with mobile and as you collaborate with different organizations? Well, I think one of the biggest concerns, and, and, you know, I'm sure the, the, everyone out there would would agree as well as the panelists is, is security we have to ensure that we have good security wrapped around what we're doing in terms of our development uh, we have to ensure that the data you know as Jay is referring to the data a, a lot about that data how that data is going to be secured and, and, and wrapped up in some sort of uh, you know encapsulation that that entails that you know that, that, that there's no breach between from one end to the other uh, so uh, on that note, we, uh, you know, as we are looking towards our development, we, uh, we ultimately, security is one of our biggest concerns about what we do and how we do it. So we're constantly looking for new technologies out there, uh, ensuring that we're going to basically wrap the security up and ensure that the integrity is there for our customers. Thank you, Barney. Uh, Joel, NWN works with countries, I mean, it works with state, local, federal government, commercial clients across the country. I'd like you to comment on where do you see innovation driving at the commercial level in government? There's always this issue where many believe that government's lagging behind what's being done in Silicon Valley and some of the commercial sectors. Could you comment on that? Sure. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a technology provider, we have to really focus on, on who really gets the technology, and that's the end user, right? So it's all really about the end user experience. So as we started pulling, uh, pulling our thoughts and our, and our plans together, you realize that, Nate, that, that uh, mobility is actually human nature. Uh, it's not going to go away. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get uh, you know, heavier and heavier as we go forward from a mobility standpoint. And really, the expectations are around the end user experience. That's really what it comes down to. And, I, and I, I'm going to do a little sidestep here. I have a daughter, 22-year-old daughter, that goes to San Francisco State. She, I call her my wild child, by the way. So I get this call about two months ago from her, and, and it starts off by... Dad, 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 dad. And I said, hello. And number one, it wasn't her phone number, so I didn't know who was calling. And uh, she says, I lost my phone. And I said, okay, well, where might your phone, did somebody steal it? Did you drop it in the toilet? Where, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just need to, I, I, don't, I can't function without my phone. And uh, I think we've all kind of been to this, 
through this one way or the other. And uh, so the first thing I did was get up and go sign on to my banking account because I knew it was going to be detrimental to my, to my, uh, to my balance <laughs> in my banking account, of which ultimately it was. But uh, uh, the point is, is that she does not use technology. She lives technology. Hmm. And her end user experience is all about navigation through her classes, apps, downloading apps to go to... Uh, to go to events and college functions, and she doesn't know I know this, but parties and friends <laughs> and everything else. So it's a, it's a full, rich experience that, that she uh, demands. It's not she doesn't want it, she demands it. And this is something that we're going to be having to deal with as future leaders come into the, to the, to the state and local governments. So with that said, NWN is focused on, on the hosted collaboration uh, platform, and there's a few reasons for that. It allows us to be agile, quickly change uh, if needed. It allows us to be flexible with easy and simple provisioning, efficiencies around resources that are fully staffed and focused, and we have uh, a quality of service, and that's because of the stable platform and the controlled environment. We all do, do this through CalNet 3, which we're on, and, and at the same time, uh, our goal is to make this easy, simple, and of high quality. So that's what we see coming down the pipe. My next question for you, Joel, would be give us an example <clears throat> where you've leveraged mobile and collaboration here in the state of California, and what change did that bring for your customer? So <clears throat> um, CalNet 3 is, is, is the vehicle we use to get through this, as I just discussed. And one of the examples I'll, I'll use is, is the uh, lottery. Uh, we're working with the lottery right now, and we've done a full integration with uh, – with a lottery relative to an existing asset that they had, Office 365 in this case, it's where we integrated the collaboration and mobility suite into their 365. So it's the ability of taking a new robust platform and integrating with an existing asset. And I think that's, that's been, a, been a good experience so far. Um, other areas that we've, uh, agencies around the state, uh, call center solutions, I am presence, VoIP, uh, call center, and uh, and WebEx applications, some combination thereof, or all uh, throughout the state of California. So we've been, we're, we're on, on a pretty good roll right now. Thank you. Rob, you have over 94,000 followers on Twitter. You clearly understand mobility, engaging people socially, but what's of interest mm -hmm. is you did something untechnical as a CIO when you began your job. I believe about 70% of your folks are out in the field. So Many times they don't have access to even you know, a broadband signal. Could you share with our audience today is how do you all at Ag Food and Agriculture leverage disruptive technologies? Uh, thank you. Uh, for us, disruptive technology has the ability to dramatically change how we do business today. Um, so what I do is I go out in the field, I talk to our veterinarians, I talk to our biologists, and I ask them questions is, what do you do? Uh, sometimes they pull out their, their smartphone, their latest Android, and I, and I said, no, what do you do? What's your job? Um, and it starts an engaging conversation as to how they do business, how they conduct business today. What I discovered from that, a lot of the business was on paper, and they take their paper and they put it in the notebook. From a technology perspective, um, for gathering all this data, it goes in a notebook and goes nowhere. You can't do analytics on a piece of paper. So my job is going back and looking at how we can leverage social, mobile, and analytics riding on the cloud. Um, and, and so I've been, applying the, um, I've been applying that technique for the last couple years. It's been very successful. So some examples of that. I view agriculture as a large community. It's not about CDFA. It's about the community of agriculture, the farmers, the packers, the shippers. Um, it's, about, um, it's about food safety. It's about... Um, ensuring the quality of the food on your table. It's about the production of agriculture in California. Many people don't realize, they think that technology is the largest sector in California. It's actually not, it's actually agriculture. We have um, impact of the financial impact on California is over $100 billion a year. On a worldwide basis, it's somewhere between six and eight trillion dollars a year of, of impact. So um, as an example from here, uh, is you, you talk about the 94,000 contacts. We have within CDFA itself about, um, about that number, about 90 to 100,000 contacts across the state. 
and how we've uh, been able to leverage technology, disruptive technologies, through use of social media to communicate. So you'll find our Planting Seeds blog I launched for zero dollars. It's a WordPress blog that our secretary uses, um, and it has national recognition. Um, it actually generates, between that and our website, about 6% of the overall California website traffic. Um, you also... So, say that one more time. Yeah, uh, like yeah sure. Um, in terms of our Planting Seeds blog and our website, we generate about 6% of the overall website traffic in the state of California's .gov domain, which is amazing. Um, you also find is our series of videos that we released the past year called uh, the California Grown Video Series. We won six Telly Awards for that series. Um, in a two-week period, our Almond video had over 12,000 views, which I find amazing. Um, and our contributions through Twitter and other channels. So clearly, we're getting the message out there through the use of social media. But I want to take that a step further. I'm looking at is how do you leverage multiple um, components of disruptive technology, looking at not just mobile, but big data. Um, looking at sensor technology, there's existing data out there, um, open data, that we can leverage and share back with the farmers. There's any way we can leverage that. A great example would be is, is there other data elements that I can use to help farmers increase their production? Um, that's something they would value. So deliver business value back to the, to the common farmer is one of my goals. Share with us a little bit more about how you enable and then engage them and give us an example of that. Sure. Um, our portfolio of projects right now is very focused on mobile. In fact, I am almost want to say mobile only. <laughs> um, and so an example of that would be report a pest. So let's say you have a bug in your yard. You're not sure what it is. You download our app. It's available for either um, the iPhone or HTML5 version that runs on pretty much anything. You take a picture of that bug, it submits it to us, our entomologist will tell you what the bug is and if it's harmful or not. And that's something that we found that's been very helpful um, from citizen engagement, is getting the citizens involved as um, our inspectors would be. Uh, so we've actually expanded our workforce by leveraging that. Another example is our cattle brand ID. Um, and one of the common problems we have in California remote locations is cattle running around in the roads. They're not where they should be. Um, and so it provides the opportunity for farmers, or in some cases the police, to identify who is the owner of this cattle and quickly contact them. Thank you. Um, next question, we're going to shift over to Tim at CalPERS. Tim, uh, share with us how mobile and collaboration is impacting you all. CalPERS, we're, we're fortunate we have a leadership team that's uh, incredibly driven from an innovative standpoint. Um, we've been a, a long time player in the social media realm. Uh, we have a CEO who is incredibly active in Twitter. We have a great Office of Public Affairs who uh, engages constituents through Facebook, YouTube. Uh, and we don't just view that as social media. Uh, we view it as an opportunity to educate as well, which is kind of a cornerstone of the, the concept of collaboration. And the success we've had over the years leveraging those social media channels uh, has emerged as something we wanted to invest internally as well. So from a collaboration standpoint, uh, our CEO wanted to establish kind of a social network within CalPERS. Uh, and so we, we actually partnered with a vendor, uh, SocialCast, that provides uh, that sort of social engagement opportunity. And it's become a standard platform for us within inside the organization. And it's not simply a means of building uh, like a social network aspect within the enterprise, but it also is uh, our emerging platform for ideation. Uh, we have invested in an organizational health index activity uh, where the entire enterprise was evaluated based on our ability to respond to change and various things. And one of the one of the common things we heard from staff was the fact that innovation seems to occur too much from the top down rather than from the bottom up. And so embracing this social channel, this collaboration tool, uh, it's it's one of our business plan objectives to leverage the opportunity to empower staff with the ability to provide innovative ideas from from the ground up. From a mobile perspective. Uh, we're still kind of in our infancy as far as identifying the best route to go. Uh, we have an interesting constituent base. 
Uh, for us, it's not necessarily about mobile, but it's en enablement of customer service. We still have IVR channels that we invest in heavily because we do have a membership base that's very diverse in age. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have an 85-year-old woman in Truckee who wants to get in touch with us, and she's not grabbing the iPhone. She's grabbing you know the plain old telephone to, to get in touch with us. So our emphasis, again, is on customer service. Uh, we do a lot of research and analysis to determine when uh, a channel is of a particular uh, strong opportunity for us to, to continue our engagement. Our current mobile initiatives are more internally focused. We want the ability to have data more accessible. We want people to be able to uh, cut through a lot of the workflow dependencies and be able to get uh, things done more quickly. We've done a lot of conceptual applications to, to establish need and get some momentum within the enterprise. We unveiled a concept application at the mobility conference, I think it was back in October or, never, or November of last year, and it was uh, integrated with our PeopleSoft system, which is our human capital management system that we use for staff management, and it was basically an evacuation rule call drill where in the event of a, a, of a uh, in the event of an event, uh, and we're, we're asked to leave the building, we have this uh, habit of having to go through and do roll call. And a lot of times, we have people who aren't present, uh, managers who aren't there to be able to uh, to check their staff. So that responsibility then would roll up to the next manager. This is a tool that integrates with PeopleSoft, has our organizational structure. It knows when people are out of the office. It provides people with a listing of staff uh, along with a photo in, in the event that it rolls up to a manager who may not be intimately familiar with a particular staff. It allows people to do remote reporting so we can identify if, uh, if everyone's left the building. We've also done a lot of mobile application development in partnership with our HR department to facilitate specialized exams. Currently, we have the Programmer 1 and Programmer 2 exam that can be uh, offered remotely. Uh, our HR department at outreach events, particularly colleges or trade schools, can go with 12 or 20 iPads and walk people through the exam process so they can better understand how to, how to get an opportunity to uh, work with the state of California. Thank you. Um, this next question I have for you is more of a policy question. And I not only see this here in the state of California, but with my position in the public sector technology chain, I talk to government executives all over the country. And in my opinion, uh, most new applications that are being built for not only the state of California, but around the country aren't taking a mobile design first approach. And my question to you is, what steps are being done to change that? Um, you know, the real issue is how are we going to change requirements and RFPs that uh, about designing an application to meet the mobile needs first, and rather than a non, you know, dictating a non-mobile design for people. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't even emphasize a mobile first approach. We emphasize a, a customer service approach, whether it's an internal customer or whether it's an external customer, and we view the opportunity to deliver services through a variety of channels with mobile being one of them. And so uh, with the emergence of mobile and the emergence of a lot of these additional collaboration technologies, uh, we, we prefer to emphasize that customer service from a requirement standpoint. Uh, the, the other thing we've learned with our substantial modernization effort where we took 49 systems and basically replatformed them into one single system, Java-based, is embracing the multi-tier approach, a lot of abstraction, emphasizing middleware services to ensure that as additional channels become available or become viable for use, it's easy for us to uh, provide an additional inlet into that application or that data. The other thing we do is, from a requirements perspective, it's not uh, build a mobile app for this device. We're, in, we're an advocate of responsive design. Uh, more so than platform specific. Um, we think that from a financial standpoint, uh, that's the most prudent path. That allows us to leverage code much more easily. It allows us to build a single code line that can be uh, delivered at the view layer or at the presentation layer uh, and adapt to the device that's being used. Um, so we also have invested quite significantly in a usability or user experience team that re resides in the application development area. So these are dedicated analysts that specialize in usability. 
Um, they're aware of mo mobile usability trends as well as desktop usability as well. They're just customer experience in general. And so they're a, a key group in establishing the appropriateness of channels, evaluating with a particular RFP what uh, requirements should exist to ensure that the end product can satisfy as many channels as appropriately as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent feedback on that. You know, as many of us realize, mobile is so much more than just technology. It's how government will receive information, how services will be delivered. Mobile requires adjustments in how we think about delivering services, how government builds systems, and interacts with the uh, citizens. Shell, uh, the question for you right now is citizen engagement is the next frontier in government. Comment on the change that will be needed in the behaviors as well as the methods and in interacting with the citizen. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, first, uh, how many people uh, quickly, uh, when you hear mobile, how many people think of this? Be honest. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm right there with you. you know, I, I always thought, you know, when you hear mobile, you think of something, some device that's not connected to, uh, to your systems back at work. But, uh, but the short definition of mobile um, these days is anywhere by anyone. So anybody can be uh, working mobily. Uh, you heard Rob talk about uh, getting data from uh, citizens. Uh, you talk, uh, we heard some other um, uh, observations around uh, uh, customer service and engagement with, uh, with citizens. And, uh, and that's kind of where I want to focus a little bit. Uh, uh, engagement with citizens is, is really just, uh, is more than uh, getting data from, uh, from your citizenry. Uh, citizens are now demanding, mostly at the moment at the local level, but make no mistake, it will filter up to the state and county levels. Uh, citizens are, are demanding a citizen-centric view of themselves, right? So they want to know, you know, they want you to know what services they're uh, consuming, what services they need. They want, a, 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 want you to have a view of them in the, in the customer service sense. So, uh, you know, they're, they're much more engaged um, presently at the, uh, the millennial level and we've tossed out that term a couple of times, but, uh, but, but really the other name for a millennial is digital native. So um, you know, this segment of the population knows a whole lot more about how to be engaged in mobile than any of us, I would dare say. Um, and they're going to show you, they're gonna hold a mirror up to you to show you what they want and what they need. And, uh, and if you're not paying attention, then, then I think you're gonna get run over. Um, they're also demanding uh, performance accountability. Um, and, and that's something that mobile can, you know, mobile technologies can, can give us if we can, uh, you know, embrace that a little bit more. As Rob said, they're collecting data for us and there's a whole lot more of that on the horizon. Uh, collecting data that you didn't know you needed, frankly. Uh, and, and what are you gonna do about that? Um, it's going to demand a bit of a culture shift inside your organizations and, and you may not personally be in a position to affect those kinds of changes. But remember the book that I mentioned at the, you know, when I introduced myself. Um, there are uh, cultural changes that would be needed inside of everybody's organization to uh, remove white space from uh, a development perspective. Uh, to to uh, embrace and engage those people who are wanting to help you solve problems that you didn't know you had. Uh, how many people have heard for, uh, of Code for America? Uh, just a few. So I would uh, think it's a very uh, small subset of those folks who have uh, actually attended a, a local brigade meeting. So these are people who are, in case you don't know, these are people who uh, are millennials engaged in civic technology movements, embracing or, or engaging with government in, uh, in, in writing applications that you're going to be asked to, uh, to, to integrate into your, uh, into your environments. Um, it's, you know, we're seeing it, that there's a Code for America Brigade right here in West Sacramento working with the mayor's office. Uh, you know, solving problems around health and human services uh, that um, uh, that the, the city government has uh, uh, has either ignored or didn't know they had those problems. But but this is just kind of a little preview of, of what to expect here. So uh, a culture of communication is something that you're going to want to build inside your organizations. 
Um, you're also going to want to look at your processes for how you do things and get out in front of uh, improving them or somebody else is going to do that for you. Um, and that's going to have a profound effect on leadership. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to be a, 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 a doomsayer here, but you know, I, I think some careers are going to be affected by uh, being able to stay in front of things or not, right? So if, if you're not able to stay in front of things and you're going to stick your feet in the mud and, and, uh, and, and say we can't change uh, for whatever combination of reasons, and Barney mentioned security, which is totally important, but you're going to have to figure out how to get that done uh, or, or you'll be replaced, I would think. Um, you're going to have to uh, get better at, uh, and, and Jay mentioned this, you're going to have to get better at, at working with data, at figuring out what that means, um, at analytics, at performance management. And it might not be you, per se, but it's got to, somebody in your organization is going to have to get better at that. And, uh, and, and I think that that's a, a big frontier for, um, for state government. Um, on the IT side, uh, which is where maybe most of you play, um, you're going to have to get more comfortable with APIs, and uh, you know start getting away from the hard-coded interfaces. Start thinking in terms of publishing uh, your uh, web services, making them web serviceable. Um, get more comfortable with APIs, and and um, possibly uh, that might mean fewer RFPs. I don't know. Um, we don't know all the impacts of, uh, of the civic engagement toward, uh, you know, civic technology yet. In the short term, I think it might look like a little bit more work for you, but in the long term, it's not going away. These are the people that are going to replace you, essentially, uh, you know, at the end of your career. And, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're going to be more and more involved, and they're bright, they're, uh, they're um, uh, funny, they're, you know, they're motivated. Uh, and they, you know, the, the Code for America people do all of this in their spare time because it is so motivating for them to help government. Uh, so it's, it's something that you're going to want to pay attention to. It has the attention of, uh, of elected officials um, at the local government level, uh, and it will filter up to the, uh, and, and how many times uh, has anybody heard this term? Uh, recently, like in the last couple of years, let's just go get Silicon Valley. They're in our backyard. They can solve these problems for us. How many people have heard <laughs> that, right? So that's the, the, the state, um, that, that's the state level application of, of this uh, civic engagement. Um, and, you know, there, there's lots of examples out there besides Code for America of, uh, you know, sort of tech SWAT teams coming in and solving problems. So, um, you know, you're going to want to pay attention to those kinds of things. Uh, Shell, uh, one of the things I'd like to talk to you about is as we're creating all these new silos of data everywhere, what are the risks? I mean, it, it goes along with it. There's absolute risk when you have information uh, carrying it around with you. Well, uh, you know, obviously don't, don't do it. Don't create silos if you can, uh, if you can at all help it. Um, and, you know, we heard about, um, you know, the uh, mobile design forward. You know, think about how, you know, what you're doing and how it needs to connect to somebody else. What we do at Stewards of Change is uh, to help governments become more interoperable with all of, uh, of the services that they provide for a citizen so that you can see that citizen-centric view. You can see if, uh, if somebody's getting a benefit check but they're incarcerated and maybe they shouldn't be getting that. Um, you know, you can see if, uh, if somebody is, is getting one type of uh, uh, of service if they also qualify for another type of service and, and kind of do that uh, proactively. Um, I mentioned that we don't know all of the impacts of the uh, civic technology uh, movement yet and, uh, and so I don't know if they are creating new silos of data or, or new um, uh, areas where we, where we have to, you know, create more work for us in the short term. Um, but the, the, the point is to, ch to change your design practices so that you're not uh, building silos. Um, the second thing I would suggest to you is that you create a strategy for dealing with citizen-generated silos, right? So if people are going to be building applications that they're going to give to you for free and want you to use, and your elected officials are basically saying, yes, we embrace this, you're going to do this, then you're going to have to have a strategy for how to integrate that kind of stuff in. Um, the third thing I would suggest is Adopt and use the appropriate standards for your industry, whatever that is. Um, and if you can't decide, just pick one and go there, right? 
just start using some kind of standards. The National Information Exchange Model is a good one for transport, for data transport. And I would imagine that every single one of the, uh, the vertical industries in government has their own set of standards. So make sure that you conform with that. Um, and and that's, that sort of gets into the API space again. A lot of the, uh, the standards organizations are starting to build their standard APIs for uh, particular um, processes in your industry. So uh, be open whenever possible. Open is not a bad word. I remember sitting in the audience uh, like you are, you know, 10 years ago thinking, open, oh my God, that's not secure. That's not, you know, that's, that's not something that I can deal with. It is secure. It is something that you can deal with. An open standard just basically means that everybody knows how you're doing that thing and then they can connect with you appropriately. If it's not appropriate, don't connect with them. Um, design for bridging, right? Design more modern modular uh, uh, systems. And, and build that, uh, that mobile forward or that, um, that citizen-centric uh, design forward um, application before you think about building uh, something that's not going to connect. Always keep in the back of your mind, who else is going to want to use this data? You know, who else is, you know, who, what else is this population going to need? That citizen-centric view is going to be part of your vernacular here very shortly, so uh, you're, you're going to want to get used to that. And then uh, lastly, I think I would suggest require your vendors to guarantee portability of applications that they build for you uh, and modularity. Um, so, so build that in. There's lots of work being done at the, um, uh, at the federal level, in, at least in the health and human services space, around certifying vendors that, uh, you know, to, to be more um, portable with, uh, with the things that they build. So I'll stop there. Shell, sure, thank you. Uh, Fantastic comments. I took a lot of notes on that. We're going to shift over to Jay Song. Jay, I have a two-part question for you. I mean, Highway Patrol, you have such enormous ground to cover. And, uh, you, know, you, you know, you talk about mobile. It's right there in the cars with our officers that serve our great state. Two-part question. I'd like you to comment on how Highway Patrol is redefining the role of IT in government operations. And then give me an, an example of how you all have taken advantage of cloud for promoting data sharing among other government agencies, what you give open access to. All right, thank you for the question. Well, mobile for me is patrol car, not phone. Couple thousand car on the street every day. Each one of them is our mobile public service unit. So uh, I would say we're well, probably not redefined, we just, uh, follow the industry trend how to um, take advantage of information technology for CHP operation. We are the largest mobile government in the state. We have 70% like, of our workforce are mobile. So we started mobile like, uh, probably earlier than a lot of agency and we have no choice because that's the citizen centric <laughs> demand because you have to provide a service anywhere anywhere they, they go. Uh, the role of technology, uh, particularly in law enforcement, is on demand anytime. And there is no um, excuse for any delay. And when public safety is uh, on the line, and uh, that's speed and also the uh, capability is uh, the key. We have developed a lot of technology to meet the federal standard and also the uh, state uh, DOJ standard, how to provide a public service securely and uh, in timely fashion. We are moved to the new generation. We talk about millennial and also the called I generation, everyone as I, uh, iPad. So the citizen, our uh, Californians are looking for the service to be delivered and on, in, in the hand. Um, so we are, actually um, working on meeting the challenge of uh, the new uh, service demand and uh, we are trying to uh, re uh, not reinvent, trying to be uh, creative to adopt those new technology to uh, speed up our service. And so the role of IT in CHP is evolving and also <laughs> it's, it's very, very high demanding. Um, it, it's a challenge, but we, we are all working uh, with our vendor partner and also working with our uh, uh, other airline agency to move forward on that. Uh, cloud. 
uh, like you, uh, Cheryl said, uh, open was very, very alert word in law enforcement uh, world. Anytime you say open, DOJ will say close right now. No, they are not saying close anymore. <laughs> Actually, DOJ right now is the leader to lead open data, open government. They develop a lot of new wave, the uh, new generation of technology which will provide CGS data, uh, provide the traditional criminal uh, information. Uh, traditionally, you can only get it from a uh, very, very uh, restrict device. Now it's mobile, so you can access uh, up to date uh, CGS data on your mobile device. So uh, we are open securely, and we are building our infrastructure to move to the direction of the cloud. The cloud is the future for uh, information, particularly for government agency. We have no resource or bandwidth to reinvent the wheel to build cloud center or data center. Even though we have one, but we, in the future, we probably will take advantage of a lot of uh, uh, commercial cloud there, because uh, Microsoft just announced a new uh, data center, $1.5 billion in Ohio. There's no way we can, we are, we, there is a way, but it's not a good use of taxpayer money to do that. So we're gonna take advantage, So, which is good for government. Now save us huge investment on that infrastructure, then we can focus on security, we can focus on the front end application to deliver better service. Um, so there are a lot of technology mature and uh, even CIA, FBI, they began to put their very sensitive data in the commercial cloud and uh, in different cloud. So we, we are very uh, uh, excited actually to move to that direction. Of course, work with DOJ, our control agency. <laughs> so uh, we, we are uh, the advocate for uh, future cloud computing. Thanks a lot, Jay. Um, my next question is for Dr. Rana, and I'd really like to hear your opinion as a physician and tech technologist. We have a uh, you know rare gift here of having both those things in one person. There is a lot of change going on in healthcare right now, from Medicaid to Medi Medi-Cal. How's your organization adapting and responding to the pace of change right now? So we have uh, 130,000 possible providers that can bill our system today, 11.5 uh, million beneficiaries. And in 2014, we had about 200 million claims processed for about $20 billion. And this is growing, and it's growing because the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. And uh, one of the projects that our division specifically is tasked with is, is changing or moving our legacy claims processing system over to a modern architecture, which um, Xerox Corporation is handling for us. Um, it's one of the larger IT projects in the state of California. and and. With the amount of change that's happening, with the amount of growth that's coming, um, the traditional approach that had uh, taken place before was we were using a waterfall approach where we spend countless months, years defining requirements. We then do a one massive change and all the risk is at the end when we deliver a product. And, and the problem with that is, is by the time we have a product that's in production, it's designed for requirements that were several years old. And with the amount of change that's coming, we needed to be nimble. So the division and the department made a de decision to change over to the agile software development methodology. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to respond quickly to uh, uh, you know, our business owners and, and, and meet our business objectives through early and continuous delivery of our most valuable software. And last week, one of my colleagues des described uh, the project that we have as, as taking uh, the wings on an in-flight Boeing 747, changing those wings or redesigning those wings while we're above the ocean with passengers in the plane and making sure that we get the flight landed at its destination without any mistakes. And so we just can't put the stop on delivery of medical care in the state of California. We have to keep going. And so we brought in these 30-day sprints. What it allows us to do is to tackle small portions of, of the change of this system, have a lessons learned at the end, and we can make those mistakes and roll the lessons that we learn out of those mistakes into the next sprint. And we found that it 
promoted better communication. Now, all of us up here have our smartphones, tablets. I have a bunch sitting in front of me. Um, one of the things that we do is we conduct a lot of our meetings over the telephone, WebEx. Mm -hmm. um, and what we found was we were losing something um, in, in sort of distancing uh, folks from face-to-face, -face, you know, away from face-to-face -face meetings. So as a part of pushing forward in the technology side of things, we found that conducting face-to-face -face meetings with our business partners, our business owners, and the technical staff allowed us to have better and more effective communication. And so the other part uh, that we've done is, is as a part of the Agile approach is that, you know, it promotes better transparency and surfacing impediments to, to, to project progress. And that goes back into the lessons learned issue. And, and so what we also realize is that our organization is designed for the legacy system. Um, our thinking is designed for the legacy system. And as we bring in new parts of this, uh, this new replacement system, we also realized that we had to retrain our division uh, staff. And so one of the things is we brought in mm -hmm. folks, uh, new talent, new people. I'm one of those folks mm -hmm. that is new. I've only been uh, a part of the division for about a year and a half now. And, and so what we did is the folks that have been there for a long time, we've instituted a, a leadership institute um, called Emerging Leaders, where we kind of take the agile approach to the world and, and we support and reinforce the culture around uh, this development methodology, improving our communication uh, with folks. And so what we found is, is that Agile is not just how we deliver our software products, but it's just how we uh, conduct uh, our day-to-day our -day work and our, and our conduct with, uh, with our colleagues. Yeah, and what I have found in you know, the legacy issue is not just germane to California. It's a national issue. It's a federal issue. I, we do forums and talk with people, and I'd say half of the executives I meet with are dealing with. And what a powerful image you gave us. Let's just take a pause here. A plane over the, over the ocean. They're changing the wings with people in an expected landing. Good luck with that. <laughs> I do have one other question for you. Um, the public's expectation of what constitutes good customer service is constantly evolving, especially in this era of, of mobility. Can you comment on how and what you all are doing to improve customer service at Medi-Cal? So the big thing with the massive uh, expansion of, of Medicaid in the state and having 11 and a half million beneficiaries is we need to make sure that we have a vibrant provider network uh, mm -hmm. of doctors, uh, nurse practitioners, dentists, um, technicians, staff, other folks that can provide the services needed to deliver good care to these folks. And, and, and the way that we do that is by providing good customer service. And part of that is we need to make sure that folks get paid. But we also have to remove the barriers and the friction to getting that reimbursement to our folks. And it's not just about courting doctors into Medi-Cal, it's about keeping them once they're in and, and making sure that uh, the newest, most effective treatments are available to our beneficiaries. And so what we've done is we're evaluating all of our existing communication channels, whether it's the website, the call center, publications, uh, subscription services, uh, we're looking into social media, we're looking at just about everything. But the, the point is that we have to look at uh, what is our population doing today. So to do that, we've instituted provider surveys. I, I regularly go out to our stakeholders uh, once a month, once a quarter, to ask them, how are you talking to your membership? How are you communicating? What are the newest trends? Webinars, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, everything is being used these days, and we want to make sure that what we're doing is effective and, and also caters to, to our folks. Now, I say that because there are still physicians out there, and some of us are very forward-thinking, but some of us are very much stuck uh, from, you know, when we were in medical school. So we have our holdouts. While a majority of our claims processing today is electronic, um, we still have people that insist on paper. And so how do we reach out to those folks? And so while they may be uh, a minority in terms of volume, mm -hmm. we expend an inordinate amount of resources supporting the infrastructure of converting paper into the electronic realm. And that's where surveys come in. We've also engaged our private sector partners. Um, 
I was just on a call the other day uh, with um, the executive leadership from Zappos, the shoe company. Um, okay. they're, they're a $4 billion company, and, and their differentiation is that they sell shoes at MSRP online. And, and as we've seen with shopping online, it's a race to the bottom and who can offer the cheapest uh, product. Um, what Zappos has done is they offer the same price you'd find it in a brick and mortar store, but their differentiation is that, hey, um, if you come to us and you have a problem, we're going to make it right. And what they've done to, to reach that level of uh, amazing customer service is they've empowered their agents to solve the problem of their, their clientele. And, and, and in one example yesterday, they were saying that, you know, even if it takes an eight hour phone call, they're going to encourage their, their telephone service center rep to sit on the phone for eight hours. Now, how do we translate that into, uh, you know, the public sector environment where that doesn't make sense? How do we incentivize our fiscal intermediary that runs our telephone service center to be able to move the call volume that's necessary, but make sure that when a physician calls in and has a problem with getting paid, and they're offering a unique service such as you know, proton beam therapy to children mm -hmm. when they're the only provider in the state that does it, we don't wanna lose that service. So how do we make sure that they, they you know, get that uh, issue resolved? Now what we've done is folks like me have been brought in to, to work with them, but we need to have that culture out you know, right. into the organization. So what also Zappos did is um, they, you know, they've talked about, you know, taking uh, a, a customer service first uh, approach. Um, they, they talk about supporting their employees, making sure they're happy so they deliver the best care possible or, or best customer service possible. Um, and so um, it's, it's about making sure that our, our, our folks are happy our, our, our fiscal intermediaries, uh, mm -hmm. employees are happy, we're addressing their needs. And so um, we're also looking at other things um, uh, on the website, for example. We don't want just a passive uh, a website that, that sits there and, and you attempt to Google it, you can't find anything, you're on your iPad, you're on your iPhone, you actually can't locate anything. So we're looking at uh, something called live chat, where we do, you know, we have something, a, a pop-up that shows up. You know, we can ask our folks that are on the website, what is it that you're looking for? How can we help you? So we can direct them into our channels that we have to get them the help they need to resolve. Right, and, and you all will even call people back so you don't have to stay online for, which is, yes. I, I take care of an elderly father-in-law and a lot of the calls we've had to do, I love that, that I don't have to stay on the phone and, you know, I've got my mobile with me all the time. So it, that is a tremendous service. So the entire point is that we want to make sure that we're solving problems. Mm -hmm. And so that is our key and that is the metric that we're going to measure ourselves mm -hmm. against. And, and so if that means that we're going to explore and think outside of the box, we're going to do that as an organization going forward. Interesting. Did you want to chime in on that? You know, um, <clears throat> I'd like to add something to what the doctor had said uh, as it relates to our, you know, providers within the state of California uh, and, and the Camus division. Um, we're, you know, DHCS uh, under the umbrella of the Camus division, we're actually uh, going forward with a new application, which is a web-based application for our providers within the state of California, where it basically cuts down the amount of time for a provider to become enrolled. It's called the provider enrollment, provider application validation enrollment uh, uh, web, web application, where it takes the amount of time it takes for them to become enrolled as a provider for the state of California to help us out. It, t it cuts down that time period from like 30 days, 45 days to like less than a week or about a week's time. So to that end, I would, you know, I wanted to add into that, that, you know, the things that we are doing under that particular division and some of the technologies that we're moving towards is that we're developing these type of applications that basically cuts down the paper, the amount of paper time it takes to, you know, to basically get that application filed, filled, and validation back to the provider to say that they are now provider for the state of California. So, you know, I wanted to add into that, that we are moving towards those kind of efforts, so. Thanks, Barney. Next question is for Christian Griffith. Christian, you have a really unique position, very different from anyone else on the panel. So what I'd ask you to do is um, I kindly share a little bit about what you do uh, with the state of California. And then my first, after you do that, my first question for you, tell us where do you think the state of California is not innovative with the business process? Well, thank you. Um, 
Hi, I'm Christian Griffith. I'm the chief consultant of the Assembly Budget Committee. Uh, we are the, the, the committee in the uh, Assembly that crafts the state budget, uh, largest committee in the legislature, about 100 hearings a year. And uh, unfortunately, when we actually encounter any of you, it's never pretty. Um, we are <laughs> we're there to fund the $20 million for the lawyers, for the controller, to fight the fight and what happened to my my CalPays, or we're there to try to figure out the uh, cost overrun in the big project, or we're there because uh, something didn't get delivered, and that, or having to deal with snarky BSA audits. I mean, that's basically when we end up seeing a lot of your work. And, and, and one of the reasons I wanted to be here today is because I actually don't get to see a lot of like good products. The only time we get to see anything is when somebody needs money, or they need more time, or they need something. So it's kind of nice to get some examples of like successes, as opposed to, you know, these very sad stories. And, and I think what that has done is it has, you know, really um, shaken, I think, some of the confidence, especially among the people I work for in, in the assembly, about how much we really are capable of in, term, in terms of technology. Uh, you get sort of two messages when you talk to, to my bosses. One is, why isn't everything on my phone? And then sometimes shaking their head, can we ever do it right? And I think that's a real challenge for us. And one of the things that, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to sort of tell the story and how to look at, you know, what's going on in technology. And, and our biggest challenge, in my mind, is that we're not all that fabulous at changing our business processes to take advantage of new technology. We just seem to be really flummoxed about how to adapt with, you know, the way we used to do things to any new technology, and it, it, even phone systems. It doesn't have to be like, you know, anything really even modern, but just using phone trees, really hard for us. Uh, we, you know, we can have 5% return call, 5% of the people calling into one of our phone systems actually getting their call answered. That's actually a performance metric from last year from one department. I mean, that is not atypical. And so it's one of these things that, that's hard for us. And, and part of the challenge for that is that, you know, our human capital at the state is lacking. We don't have, um, you know, the right people with the right skill sets. And, and frankly, we, you know, have a, the way we've kind of pay people, it, there's some people who actually take a pay cut if they go to a managerial position. So we end up with a lot of people who want to stay at those hourly jobs. And we, we don't have people moving up. And so we have a lot of vacant CA1 positions across departments. It's really difficult. And so one of the challenges for us is we're not building that leadership. And that puts us in this kind of power imbalance where we look to vendors to, to solve our solutions for us, but not just provide the technology, but tell us how to do our job. And I think, you know, as we um, are now out of the recession and we're not talking about, you know, running around with our hair on fire and oh, we're all going to die and being all, you know, winter is coming, we're able to sort of talk about the future and be more, more optimistic. I think it's time to talk about, you know, how can we do very simple things? I mean, we don't have things on the internet that, you know, other states had in 1995. I mean, there, this is not like rocket science. Like, rocket science is old. I mean, it's not, you know, nanotechnology, okay? That's, that's newer. Um, and, and, you know, I think it, part of it is we need to, you know, start thinking about building the capacity internally um, within the staff and leveraging a lot of the talent that you all have. I think the, the hard thing for us is that, you know, a lot of you are dispute, dispersed all over the state, um, but, you know, it's not, brought together in a way where it's, it, we can leverage it very well at the 10,000 foot level where I sit, where we look at all the departments and all the state expenditures and, and try to figure out how to make that work. Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. I'd like to just uh, comment on that uh, because I also heard um, uh, the, the doctor mention. Uh, Dr. Rana. Yeah, the notion, mentioned the notion that, uh, you know, we're, we're building new systems and I, I knew about those new systems, but we don't really have to be building new systems. I mean, the, the, the cold, hard fact of the matter is that, you know, the airline industry, the insurance industry, the banking industry still runs on COBOL. Mm -hmm. So we don't really have to be building new systems. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that we don't have the right talent really resonates because, we, we, you know, we're not looking to how we can leverage the assets that we have in new and different ways and more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, so I would challenge everybody out there uh, to, to, you know, look at how you can leverage the assets that you have. 
um, uh, more effectively. And, and I think I agree that, first I will say I love COBOL because COBOL to me is like a VW bug. Like you can fix it, it's easy to, it's easy, it's dependable, it, it never, it will never have airbags, it'll never, you know, but it's like a 1960 VW bug, it's very simple and easy and, you know, stable and, and it works. But the challenge is like, I think w with, with the state is we keep getting, making changes to our programs and that's not the best program to use as a basis to a program, we're going to keep changing the rules on it every year, uh, like we seem to do in pretty much every program for some reason. Um, so that, that, but I think that's a very good point. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about how we change policy, and we're we're in a really neat time in the world where we're seeing a lot of trends in federal, state, and especially in big city government where they're being creative to change policy. Talk to me here in the state of California about how we can improve and policy as a takeaway for any of us that, uh, any of the you know, government executives that are here in our audience? Well, I, I, one thing I, I feel like we need to do, and this is gonna maybe seem a little controversial, is we actually have to hire a lot of new people. Um, and, and I'll give you an example, Cal per, uh, Cal, uh, Caltrans, okay? Caltrans has engineers that build the roads, and they've got about 4,000 of them. 40% uh, of them are within five years of retirement age. We haven't hired an engineer in Caltrans since 2007. So that's eight years. So what that means is two things. One, we, you know, in a couple years from now, we're going to have a lot of compaction, and people are going to go to start working at Caltrans and get promoted up like crazy, and they're not going to have a lot of time to learn. But also means that whatever they're teaching today in the fancy engineering, civil engineering schools around the world, I mean, we're not benefiting from because we don't send people to conferences either. So they don't go to conferences. They don't have any new blood. I mean, I don't know how we're going to be able to deliver you know, the kind of the normal, you know, state of the art, you know, level of service if we're not in an organization that doesn't, you know, have that vibrant circulatory system. And the recession really kind of cut us off. We really we were just trying to, you know, at one point we weren't making cash, you know, we weren't making our cash payments. We were issuing everyone IOUs. You might all remember that. That was really fun. Um, so, you know, that we had to do what we needed to do to survive. But now we're out of that. And we need to think of ways to try to build the human capital bench and try to get, frankly, more of these millennials in there where, you know, the way they think about the world is mobile and through their phones. So, like, things that they see in their head, um, and the way they interact is second nature, where we're just trying to play this guessing game about, well, what would my 16-year-old think? And what would this, you know, we're trying to kind of put ourselves in that place. Uh, and I think, you know, the more we have that, that in, in our um, organization and, and have that have ability to sort of use the, our inbred talent, I think the more effective will be. And I also think we need to, to try to build a core of staff that know enough about project management and how projects run and business process to be able to hold our own with the vendors. I feel like we are always at a power imbalance there. And sometimes not even deliberately. I think sometimes the vendors don't realize how little sometimes the people talking to them understand their own business or understand what technology can do. And we end up a lot of these technology projects it looks like, you know, we, we start off and everything looks great and then it goes, goes peels off. And then the problem for us is that you never tell us that until it's absolutely a train wreck. So, what? Well, because you you got your your vendor is like your you know your partners and you you guys are you have your fights private but you never tell us so it's all this so we get like a report and it'll come out like this, everything is great and we love each other and everything's going well and then like two weeks later it's like okay we hate them and we're gonna sue them and you know it's like <laughs> it's totally opposite because because you have to keep that relationship going and it's really important but I think the more the stronger we are with our state staff I think the more effective we'll be as partners with vendors because we'll be able to like hold them accountable on the ground level stuff that kind of um, you know it, it which I think compounds upon itself to make these bigger problems that we always have thank you Christian oh yeah Jay please go ahead so I, I, I just want to follow up on something Christian said because you know there there are very few silver linings to the recession um, but maybe one is it's kind of across the board I mean the city hasn't really hired new people in the last five six years most government agencies haven't and um, across the board you have massive retirements whether it's in the teaching profession which is going to be very serious um, bureaucracies across the state and you know as we hire kind of Millennials now to fill in who are coming in with a different set of skills and you're completely right I mean I've two boys who are 24 and 22 they'll never order a newspaper they'll never buy a magazine at Iraq um, you know, technology is just part of them. It's not, for me, it's an appendage 
that you know when there's a problem, I go to one of the under 30s in my office and say, "Fix this for me," because I don't understand what's going on here. But um, so I think we have an opportunity now. That the biggest challenge is as we change over systems. Unlike most private business, nobody's putting 40 million dollars aside and say use this to retool your business. It's all running down the runway as we're taking off, trying to do it at the same time. Um, but, I, but my hope is kind of at the policy level, we can think about what do we need to put aside so when we want to make these changes, because we have a new group of individuals, a new cohort of, of workers in the state of California at all levels, how can we use their knowledge and skills and their aptitude for technology to change the systems that we have? Really good point. I'm going to shift. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you have something else you wanted to? Add? I'm going to shift over to Joe. Joe, I have a kind of a different question. I know we've been focusing a lot on government, but you know, one of the things is what can the vendor community do? We, you know, today attending this event, we have Intel, Google, Microsoft, NWN, Cisco. A lot of vendors are here in the audience. What can they change in their approach to government when they're knocking on the door saying? See my widget. You got to meet with me. And uh, could you comment on that? Oh, the comment on the COBOL. I used to have a '69 Volkswagen Bug, and it ran forever. But boy, there were a lot of those Volkswagen buses on the road that were basically not operative. So at some point, COBOL is going to be a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they're cool. Um, so anyway, with respect to the vendor community, and and I hope this resonates with some of the CIOs that are in the room. I would say that the biggest thing is do your homework before you try to get into a meeting. And you know, really kind of um, take a step back and really, because each of the people that are up here from the different departments and cities or counties, um, they have different verticals, different types of business. Um, and some departments have multiple different types of business within their department or agency. So really you know, take a step back and try to understand a little bit about what that particular business is. What's their, um, if they have a business plan or a strategic plan? Some departments will have a 24 month tactical plan. Um, and then some departments, you know, have to conform to the IT capital plan. And so they're making updates as things change. So that gives you some insight a little bit about what's going on with the department. And if you're not familiar with the government process, then you really need to kind of take a step back a little bit too and understand just the administration as a whole. What's the, the budget cycle? Uh, what's happening with the, this, uh, the January budget? What's happening with spring finance? What's happening with DOF? Where is that whole process on how things get funded and how do projects get approved? And with the new STAR process that's coming in from the Department of Technology, where is a project and what stage? All that has a huge impact on if the department really wants to talk to you or if you're just kind of wasting their time. I'd also say it's not a, it's not a sprint. You know, it needs to be a marathon. It's about relationships. So a lot of new vendors come in. They want to do business in California, and they set up shop. And after six months, eight months, they're really just, you know, they're just kind of not happy with things that are going. They don't have anything in the pipeline. They haven't sold anything. Well, it's not a sprint. It takes time to build relationships. So you need to be in there for the long run. If you're not going to make that type of commitment, you're probably wasting your time and the CIO's time as well. The other thing is when you get that initial meeting, um, it's just not, that's just the beginning of it. It's the complete cycle all the way through. So it's the initial meeting, it's the stages of the proposal, it's if you win, then it's the actual bringing the team in and the execution, then it's all the way through to the delivery and support. And so um, you gotta stay connected. So if your salesperson comes in, better not disappear after you get the PO. Or you bring in your execution team, um, and all of a sudden it's a whole different team, and the CIO has never met them, and the salesperson has gone somewhere else. And so, um, or what happens is you get going, and all of a sudden you get another proposal somewhere else, and you start switching players. And you take your A team, and you start giving us your B team, and before you got your C team. And so you need to stay connected through the whole process, because it's really critical, and it's just such a small IT community here. People talk, and we'll know real quick on, on the games that are being you know, played. So if you really want to be a strategic business partner, it's really all about your, your ability to really deliver results and the impact that you're having on the business effectiveness, and that takes time to do. 
So I would say also have a kind of a, a zero tolerance um, for blame. It does nobody any good to start pointing fingers. I know once the love is over and everybody wants to start um, pointing fingers, but your job and our job is to find out what's going on, what the issue is, bring the right resources to the table, and fix it. Then we can sit there and do a debriefing and lessons learned and corrective action plans and things that we can do and put in place to prevent that. So work in a collaborative environment, work in a strategic business environment as a partner. Again, I would say do your homework, come in prepared, have something that's relevant to what you want to talk about, and then realize that it is a marathon, not a race. Thank you, Joe. Um, as, as many of you know, Joe had a very um, accomplished, distinguished career here in service to the great state of California. Um, Joe, what I want you to talk about is when you're communicating with your program areas, tell me why it's critical to determine their needs and how did you do this successfully in your career? Hmm. Everybody's time is very limited. And, um, and they, they probably have, business probably has jobs more important than what the IT has. And they're probably under a lot more pressure and scrutiny for results and accountability, probably back to the, the governor's office and the administration. So you're gonna have to pick your time wisely with them. And if you're gonna have a meeting with them, it's no different than what I just talked about. You better be prepared and you better be going in there and understanding their operations and what some of their pain points are what are some of the opportunities and challenges that they have? And are, have you done some of your homework to actually maybe think about potential um, solutions? And some of those can be low-hanging fruits, some intermediate and long-term type of things. And you know, and do you have some type of enterprise architecture roadmap that you know that you're managing toward that makes sense from a, a cost effectiveness? There's not a lot of money, even though we're kind of out of the fiscal crisis, there isn't really a lot of money being spent on IT right now. I hope that changes in the next couple of years. Uh, so you're gonna to have to get creative on a zero sum game. Do you have things to where there's a return on investment? Is there something to where if they used internal money today, you're gonna to realize those benefits within the next year and so that they, they can start to cover that? Is there creative financing to Drea Smart? Is there other ways that you can do that the payback period can be funded internally because the benefits are there? So you have to go in there and think differently from a strategy and how you're gonna fund these things. It's not all about going across the street asking for millions and millions of new dollars. And then you have to look at the support model and the sustainability. A lot of times you can fund these things with one-time dollars, but you really haven't thought about the impact to the organization and how you're gonna sustain it and support it. The worst thing you can do is tee something up, implement it, and then you have no sustainable support model and it collapses. Uh, they won't listen to you the next time when you bring an idea to them. Thank you, Joe. Um, I have just a couple more questions for our panel, and then I'm going to open it up to you, the audience. We also had a number of questions come in uh, via the Internet, Facebook, Twitter, to ask our panel, which we'll go over well. But, Lena, um, what I really enjoy about Cal Lotto is you all almost operate like a commercial entity, but yet, yet your government can you share with us a little bit as a revenue generating organization, what is the lottery's approach to expanding your mobile utilization with your consumers? Um, yes, the lottery is very different than some of these other uh, state agencies and other governmental agencies. We are a revenue generating organization and our mission to increase the supplemental funding for education is something that uh, most employees, uh, probably all, really take to heart. And so it's a very fast paced, marketing, sales and marketing organization at its core. We still have the same constraints that other governmental agencies have to some extent, but we have to be engaged with our players. We have to be engaged with our retailers. We have to have that constant communication with all of our vendor partners. And so things move very, very quickly. Uh, one of the things that we are trying to do very much is expand our mobile uh, utilization or you know, our support for more mobile utilization by our players. Our players uh, last night were pretty happy. They were hitting our website uh, 
quite a bit. Uh, we had at our peak, 8.30 p.m., we had 116,000 hits on our website per minute. <laughs> so, you know, um, and about half of these are mobile devices that are connecting onto our web page. Uh, most of them just want the information very quick. Did I win? Uh, so it was interesting to see, you know, we have this humongous utilization that we know is expected. Once the winning numbers are uh, selected, we have to be ready to provide that information. You know, people were logging on um, very quickly, and uh, we were able to support that utilization. Um, but we also want to make sure that we are uh, um, engaging our players so that they're not only visiting us on the $500 million draw nights. We want to build that player retention and that engagement with our users. And so one of the things that we're doing is really taking uh, use of the data. Um, we have gotten the Google Analytics, which used to be the purview of our marketing and, and uh, uh, corporate communications folks, but IT needs that as well. You know, so we do need to incorporate all of our social information, all of our uh, analytical information, and all of our gaming system information, and find a way, how, uh, how are we going to meld all of this together so that we know what the, the next trend is going to be for those 16-year-olds who get really bored. Uh, you know, they, they download an app and a month later it's gone. How do we keep our players engaged? How do we make sure that we're providing what they want in the way they want, wherever they want? Uh, so those are some very exciting things that we're uh, trying to take a look at, and we're trying to be proactive in, in seeing what does this mobile and digital age have in store for the lottery? How do we connect with people? We've got marketing promotions. We have uh, you know folks that wander around, um, uh, I'm gonna get the location wrong, so I won't even pretend. It's somewhere in Southern California, but we've got iPads, and we engage with our players, and we capture their data. Um, you know, it, how do we make sure that that data is secure, that those communications are secure, that in, at the same time we are delivering and we're connecting with people? Uh, we want to make sure that uh, people are educated. We are not just a revenue generating organization for us. We are providing that money to education. And so we're also taking a look at how do we communicate to everyone, what does the lottery really do? What are we doing with that money? And you know, so there are initiatives on uh, being able to expand uh, our message and to expand what we're actually doing with that. Uh, so uh, those are all wonderful things. And then we have to actually figure out how to put uh, the sales folks out there and give them what they need and communicate with retailers. Uh, just last year, we uh, issued it was last year, uh, we issued iPads um, to our mobile sales force. And this is a communication and presentation tool for them to utilize with our retailers. Uh, we have analytic information that we can show to our retailers and say, look, this is a wonderful game mix here. It's a similar size store. Here's what they did. Here's what you did. Uh, we really need to um, have ways to be able to communicate with retailers anywhere they are. And, and we have retailers that are, there's no cell reception. So overcoming the challenges of how do we make sure that we've got that information to our sales force and communicate it to our retailers, and that we also make sure that they are responsible in how they promote gaming, um, you know, and making sure that there is that element uh, that is out there. Um, most folks don't know that we have a law enforcement arm of the lottery. These are um, badged law enforcement officers, peace officers, and so we also have to provide services to them. We uh, we do get the the clutz information. Uh, mobily, because we all have a responsibility to make sure that we are uh, gaming responsibly and that our retailers are doing things right. Um, so there's all of those challenges, and you know, with um, our mobile uh, sales force and our law enforcement officers, um, these folks are in the office very rarely. And how do we make sure that they have access to our internal network, that they have the tools they need, that they have the internal communications that they need, that you know they are able to carry out their duties effectively without having to come into the office, load up on a bunch of information or paper, 
I did try to get rid of fax machines. It didn't work. Um, <laughs> why are people faxing? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> email. Um, but you know, it's it it, it is a, a something that the lottery is just always trying to take a look at. How do we engage people? How do we provide information to our retailers? How do we make sure that we are being responsible with um, the, all, all of our entrusted uh, duties? Uh, and uh, it's, it's a great organization. It's a, uh, what else can I say? <laughs> it's, it's, yes, buy a ticket. Scratchers. Yeah. She's selling tickets afterwards here today. <laughs> I, I have one last question for you. Like, Many people that have a mobile workforce. Uh, what are what are some of the challenges you all are seeing right now? Um, we yes, you know the exciting stuff is what are we going to do. The challenging stuff is how are we going to do it. Um, that public website, um, you know, and the utilization that it got last night uh, was massive. Um, we are leveraging um, cloud computing. Um, it, it, we are uh, taking advantage of uh, the cloud. Uh, for this, um, and we are also moving to Office 365. There are limited resources in government. What do we do best, and what are the things that uh, others possibly do best? Because we have to make sure that um, you know we are being fiduciarily responsible with what we have. Um, the lottery is limited in the amount of administrative spending that we have. We we are not allowed to spend above um, our percentage. And most of that, you know, um, the big chunk of it is for sales and marketing. There's not a whole lot of money for IT. Um, you know, IT projects don't drive the business. Um, IT supports the business. And we have to be able to make sure that we are supporting the business needs in a way that is cost effective and supportable and, and maintainable. Um, we have to make sure that you know our systems, I, I, some of the comments I heard here today were fantastic. It is about the portability of our solutions and making sure that uh, they are you know, broken down into those small components so that we can be nimble in making changes. So that if you know our Facebook um, users say, well, why don't you do this? We have to have a way of being able to support that. And we have to have the infrastructure in place to support that. And we have to be able to have the com compartmentalization of those different elements um, identified so that we can make the changes and not have to take the plane out of the air. Uh, it's, you know, um, the uh, challenges for uh, the mobile workforce for us are a little bit different. I mean, um, we had the opportunity of, of building a new headquarters building um, in 2011. And so a lot of the planning and thought that went into that was, okay, we know that we're having a workforce that's mobile. So we've got a corporate wireless network in the building. We also know that we have a lot of retailers coming into the building. We've got a vendor partners coming into the building. So we also have a guest network. Security is very, very important. Um, you know, we are still, uh, we still have to make sure that as we expand our use of player data, that it's secure. How do we make sure that we split out what is public and what is sensitive and what is extremely confidential and make sure that we have the proper layers in between so that we can have the data that's accessible to, you know, winning numbers. We have an API for that. Uh, we know we have media partners that we never see. We don't know who they are, but they want to know what those winning numbers are so that they can print um, in newspapers. Um, you know, what those winning numbers were for their readers. So uh, we're um, starting to take a look at what data is out there, what data should we be sharing, uh, you know, throughout the lottery, how to bring all of that together, how to make sure that it, it's accessible where it needs to be and that it's easy to do and that it's maintainable. Um, you know, our, uh, the mobile workforce, um, you know, it's, we, we're seeing uh, there are retraining efforts that have to go on because we are expecting a lot of the mobile workforce. They have to know how to use these tools. They have to know how to pull up the analytics tool and drill down and show retailers things. So there's, a, you know, this ongoing re-education that's internal 
um, that's happening. Um, and then, you know, we have to be forward thinking, okay, this is what we're doing today. What does it look like tomorrow? There's digital signage, uh, you know, are we going to be doing that? Um, how, what are the other methods that are coming up? Uh, and so all of this um, information um, is uh, currently being gathered and we are right now taking a look at the gaps uh, with all of the program areas and IT and trying to make sure that IT is a partner in the business decisions so that we are going to be ready, you know, when they say, here's what we want you to do. Okay, we have some idea of how to do it. Thank you, and I'm just catching up on my notes from what you're, but I like that make IT a partner in the business decision. Interesting, interesting feedback on that. I have a lot of notes on that. Uh, I have one last question for our panelists, and then we're going to go to you, the audience. Max, uh, Cisco is considered by many the internet of everything. Um, could you share with us, and I've always viewed Cisco as a leading company in innovation. Can you share with us what are the drivers right now going on in, in government, and what Cisco is bringing to the public sector? Sure. I, I think it's important when you use a term like Internet of Everything to define it because yeah. I think there's a lot of different ways that people can go about defining it. So the way that Cisco defines the Internet of Everything is connecting people, process, data, and things in order to create new capabilities, uh, richer experiences, and ultimately economic uh, outcomes and opportunity. So I think when you hear what's happened on the panel today, I think there's a lot of great examples of the fact that the internet of everything is upon us, right? We're in the process right now of figuring out how to connect the people and the things to our data and our processes. So I think it's very important that um, as we're talking about the internet of everything and connections, there's three different modes that we connect with. Um, you can have the person-to-person -person connectivity, and, and we're all pretty good at that. We can pick up a phone or pick up a cell phone or text, um, but some of the newer ones that we're dealing with now are, are people to machines. In, in those cases, we've got sensors and uh, a lot of big data on the back end that might be helping our workforce to do what they do in a more effective and productive way. And then you've kind of got this Terminator type mentality of machine to machine that's out there now that's starting to drive uh, a lot of thought and, and uh, ingenuity. Uh, some of those examples would be potentially uh, a disaster sensor and notification system that might remotely move a data center's operations from an impacted area to a backup disaster recovery site and not have to um, have any person hands-on engage that, but also maintain services to the critical state and local authorities that can go and help uh, to facilitate facilitate those uh, those efforts. Um, so you asked about the value. The value comes really in, in four parts. Uh, the first would be employee productivity. And a lot of times we look at employee productivity and we don't, you know, the, the first thing that, goes through our mind is doing more with less. And, and that's not necessarily always what employee productivity is about. Sometimes it's doing more with what you have mm -hmm. and being able to expand services. Um, the second would be the citizen's experience. And I think it's really important to, as we're all reimagining and trying to step into the 21st century when it comes to our, our systems and, and the experience, that what's that experience look like to the citizenship? And with that, we also want to have increased revenues and decreased expenses. So it's very encouraging to hear all of the different ways that the different agencies here in California are already moving towards that. So my, my, my next question for you here in, in our wonderful state that we have, I mean, we, you know, it's just, it's such a big, it almost could be a couple states. We have an increased need for mobile technology in our classrooms, libraries, cities, counties, and the state. How is mobile changing the way that services are delivered right now? Yeah, so you always take a risk when you get a room of this size, but I mean, everybody's got their phones with them today, right? How many of you in the last, well, have ever bought a coffee using your phone? All right, hands high. Three years ago, how many of you bought a coffee with your phone? Right, so the, the change of 
the way that mobile technology, uh, the pace of that change is, is upon us very quickly. And like Shell was saying, it's the, it's the, the citizenship that is moving and driving the demand for that change. And so as we're sitting there looking through, you know, we talked about cities and counties and the services that we provide. I think it's really important to uh, rethink how we're, we're delivering those services out to, uh, to the public. The classroom, I'm very passionate about education. It's one of the main focuses that I, I get to work with at Cisco. But education isn't just about the classroom. It's also about how we educate our workforce. And it's, it's very interesting when you compare how medicine has changed over the last hundred years and how you know something morbid like war has changed over the last hundred years but you look at education and it's very much uh, the same as it was a hundred years ago there's just now starting to be those innovations in education and like i said it's not just about the classroom but it's also about how we take education into the workforce so how do we use video to synchronously and asynchronously educate. So mobile classrooms, having subject matter experts from, you know, across the country or across the world come in to teach language and, and arts. Uh, how can we imagine how that can impact us at the state and local and government level as well? Thank you for that. And uh, speaking of uh, technology, um, I'm texting someone because I'm having trouble uh, uh, getting our mic to work, so I'm going to ask him to come in and do it. But we're going to get ready now to go to the portion of the program where um, we go to you, the audience. And this is your chance to interact with our panel. And I've taken so many wonderful notes. I mean, what an amazing discussion we just had. We had several questions come in through the internet, but now I'd like you, the audience, to interact with our panel. So I would like to ask the first question. Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, actually, there's two that I've been looking at that I really like, um, and I've seen demos of this uh, here in Sacramento. One was first, LA311. Uh, so you can use this mobile app to submit things such as graffiti removal, pothole repair, or bulky item pickup, uh, something a citizen can use. Um, second was the Veterans Affairs mobile app. I believe it won an award several years ago, um, so you can look up eligibility, um, providers, hours of operation, contact information for their facilities, um, and also find a job. I, I, think, um, I think these are examples of things that engage the constituent. Thank you. Would anyone else on the panel like to comment? Yeah, I, I just want to add on the 311, so Sacramento does that as well. Um, it's done a number of things for us. I mean, it's really reduced the workload for people answering the phones. It's allowed us to be more effective and efficient as an agency to get out and do what we need to do. And then, for example, on illegal dumping, what we ask people to do is take a picture, uh, email the picture to us so we know where we're going. We don't have a truck kind of wandering around looking for where the pile is. And so they're, they're just like cutting a lot of time and effort off of getting the job done. And I, they're, they're probably not in, in place right now, but just kind of a, if you take a look at what's happening with Sacramento with the, the new Kings Arena and some of the things that are going on with the, with the mayor, Kevin Johnson, um, just look at how things are going to change here, right here in Sacramento, just from a transportation standpoint. Um, when you're thinking about getting 18,000 people into a downtown arena, how are you going to deal with the parking and how are you going to deal with the meters and can you pay electronically? Is it going to tell you how much time you have left? Can you go ahead and pay a premium to go ahead and extend your time? Um, where is a vacant parking spot? So I think you're going to see all kinds of new innovation occurring right in front of our own backyard. And I would encourage all of us on the, on the state to take a look at this and try to piggyback and look at those ideas and how we can apply it to state government as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, something that I was thinking about, uh, you know, it, it fits into my definition of mobile as anybody, anywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, 
uh, I have a friend who is an elementary school teacher, and she needed some uh, um, equipment for her classroom, some uh, video equipment for her classroom so that she could display uh, using uh, digital technology, say a book, right? So we used to we used to call that like a, an overhead projector, but now it's kind of digital and it's kind of cool. Um, but she didn't have the money for it. So there are um, websites like GoFundMe uh, or or uh, other kinds of uh, applications where she can put her funding need out there, um, and people like me can donate a hundred bucks until they reach that funding need, and then she can go buy her, uh, her classroom equipment. I think that's a, a remarkable uh, technological advancement that allows, uh, allows things in government to get done without having to go through Christian's committee. Uh, right, so. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, another thing that we've seen, and like I said, education's a big uh, focus of mine, is uh, there's a, school district uh, just in the Central Valley called Lammersville that has recently rolled out an application uh, that use, uses Cisco's uh, technology called CMX, Cisco Mobile Experience, which actually, as a parent walks onto campus, it recognizes that they have the app on the phone and gives them the ability to push data to their phone and make sure that you know they have the latest updates or if they're at a school game, they have the ability to push, hey, you know, hot dog sale in the fourth quarter so they can get rid of, rid of inventory. Um, that type of uh, ability to talk to your patrons as they come in the door for services or be able to push information is something that in the educational space has been very effective, but I think also the state and local level could have a lot of impact as well. Thank you. Uh, did anyone else on the panel have a comment before we go to our audience question? Okay. Got a question from this gentleman right here. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, hi. Uh, so my question is, those are wonderful examples of bundling and pushing information to clients. My question is, can somebody provide some good examples of uh, pulling information or collecting information from your customer base and how you handle the security coming into your network system for storage of those data? Thank you. I can think of one. Um, in the city of Chicago, uh, somebody mentioned pothole examples. Um, you know, that's, that's data coming in. Um, uh, health violations, uh, health code violations for restaurants. Um, the, uh, uh, Jay had the, the, the example of uh, getting a, a photograph of uh, illegal dumping. That's data coming in. So you have to ask yourself, is this sensitive data? Is this confidential data? Is it PII? Is it open? If it's open, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your path is a lot um, more smooth, right? So I, I, I think that, um, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about um, yet, but maybe somebody has some thoughts on it, is uh, security uh, that is role-based. Right, so when we're looking at applications, at, at building applications, can we think about uh, building in security that is role-based? What is the nature of the person in, uh, that's gonna use that application? What data should they be able to look at uh, or download or, 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 or even upload? Um, and then, you know, what's the, what's the nature of the data themselves? You know, is it, is it something that we really have to be worried about? And, and then that way you can sort of segment uh, you know, how you can do things and what you can get done uh, in a priority fashion. I have something to add to that. So I talked earlier about Report-A-Pest. Um, what we found interesting was the actual mobile development actually didn't take all that long. The hard part was the processes on the back end. Uh, we actually had to develop a screening application to view the photographs because we receive hundreds a day. And some of the odd things we ran into is photographs coming from outside of our country of insects. Um, we still respond to those. But sometimes we get photographs that have nothing to do with insects. Uh, and we have to deal with those. <laughs> and we have to deal with those. So we keep the system separate. We, see, we keep our um, internal system clean. Um, and then we do, um, we have within that system, uh, if we do find something of an interest, we then transfer that uh, electronically to our internal system. So um, yes, you do have to develop processes um, both business processes and electronic processes to manage that data coming in. And, and our technique was to keep them separate. So if any of you want to know what the photos are, how many took them, like what, what exactly is that? 
I'd like to I'd like to add in on, on what on some of that. Uh, I, I think uh, Shell hit the the nail on the head there. I think it really kind of depends on the data, whether it's confidential and whether there's a, you know PII. You know, uh, once you have those kind of technologies in place to be able to segregate that data, and there are tools that are out there that can really kind of help you determine. I think it's important to have the 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 right kind of. Uh, pieces of equipment in place that's going to basically either encrypt the data while it's at rest or while it's in transit. So as it relates to your question, how do you handle that type of security? It really boils down to really what, what kind of information is coming inbound to you from, from our, at least from our perspective as well, from healthcare services. You know, we're a, we're a HIPAA compliant department. So to that end, we have to basically ensure that we're having, you know, uh, tools in place to, you know, encrypt it in transit and at rest, as well as on the line as well too. So, you know, having those kind of intrusion prevention and detection solutions in place to help with that is really key from our perspective. Sure. Uh, CalPERS, we do a lot of data exchange, both from a health perspective and an investments perspective. Uh, even with employers, we get monthly updates from a payroll when we have new memberships added in. And so we have a large data uh, portfolio that includes HIPAA, PII type of information, as well as sensitive uh, data information. So we spend a lot of time uh, defining data classifications. Uh, it's a very deliberate exercise. It's very critically important for us to, to make sure that uh, we have an understanding of the data that's coming in and going out as well. Uh, it's a standard recipe of encryption in, encryption at rest, encryption out, but then we also do a lot of monitoring uh, with data at rest as far as database access, who's looking at what, who has access to what. It's it's a laborious activity, but incredibly important to be vigilant in that regard. Uh, and it, it, it just really focuses on understanding uh, the, the data itself and then making sure that you have a very well defined and, and monitored by uh, like a non-IT body as far as the enforcement of those policies. Yeah, hi, hey Jamie, uh, James Waterman from Google. I heard earlier a little bit of snickering when we talked about could Silicon Valley come in and help? Could we come in and solve some problems for the state of California? How could we have an impact on government and the citizens of the state of California, et cetera? And my question to you guys uh, will come up in just a minute, but I want to lay out a couple of points. I think it's important to do so and then ask the question. You know, we hear so often when we talk about Silicon Valley that uh, uh, and and the models that we use with consumers, et cetera, around security. FBI, 55,000 mobile users using Google. The FBI, secure, proven secure, CJIS compliant, et cetera. Department of State, 85,000 users just signed up. We're building amazing, amazing systems out of Silicon Valley. We had a few guys when we talked about Code for America and people who will come in literally on their own time with their own desire to have an impact on society to show up and, as an example, help DC fix healthcare.gov for the country. And if you do your research, and I think I heard someone up here talk about how important it is, maybe it was you, Joe, to do your research, research before you form these opinions. The, the reality is, if you go out and look at uh, Time Magazine articles or look up on Government Technology Magazine, a great profile they did on Mikey Dickerson and how he from Google and a number of others from Silicon Valley came out in very short order, applied Silicon Valley mentality, methodology, and technologies, approaches to solving problem to fix the healthcare.gov issue. My question is, you know, these things happen again and again. What do we, particularly in the cloud, uh, what do we need to do in Silicon Valley to overcome some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that exists when I hear snickering and things like this, when we seem to be so disconnected from the reality of what's going on and our readiness to partner with you guys, what can we, in, you know, particularly software as a service or cloud vendors, what can we do to gain your confidence to move forward? And then finally, I'll do one other thing. You know, we're ready to step up and prove it. Uh, we've offered up Innovation Labs uh, to some of you guys. We'll take any five hairy, challenging problems you have and, and uh, pass every test. We'll, we'll, we'll build it before your eyes. And if anybody would like to jump in on that, we'd love to partner with you. Again, question. Just so much information about the Rocky Mountain community. The question is, what are the what do you, what's the general purpose of the Rocky Mountain community? 
James, that was a hell of a speech, sales speech. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Great, man. I love that. Day. But, it, oh, it does. It does. You know, um, if I can just, you know, comment to how, what, can the, what can the vendors do? And then it also goes back to Joe's uh, comment about, you know, being prepared. I, th I think that goes both ways. It's both a public and private uh, sector uh, collaboration that really should take place because we too have to understand your needs uh, and, and as well as put that trust in you. So I just want to be clear about that, you know, from, you know, to elaborate on Joe's point of view. It, it goes both ways. It's, you know, you guys have to understand our needs, especially as it comes to the, uh, to the budget cycle and, and the procurement cycle. You know, oftentimes we have to vet our procurements through both legal and contracts. But as it relates to your question, um, honestly speaking, you know, from, from our perspective, we look at it, we understand it, we get it. We have top-notch security folks and, you know, within the state. Uh, and and they, go to the, they go out to the private sector eventually at some point or they stay within the state. But I think it's really about a culture change is what it comes down to. Uh, you know, we, still, we get it and, and we understand it. And I think it's just a matter of taking that step forward is what it comes down to, at least from our perspective. Because oftentimes, you know, in, in, in various programs, especially within healthcare services, we talk about cloud services and we talk about how we can basically uh, move towards putting things in the cloud. Well, technically, not everything is really cloud re uh, ready and available and suitable to be, to be honest. You know, there's so many uh, ancillary pieces of equipment that you have to consider. You know, you have to consider return on investment. But the bottom line is, at least from my perspective, it's really about that, that cultural shift in terms of knowing that we don't have real true control over the data and, and how we manage it. We have to basically put that faith in the vendor that we're going forward with to basically know that they're going to protect it both in transit and at rest and, and know that if it's, it's going to be protected while it sits out there. So, uh, you know, I think uh, over time, I think we're getting there. I mean, as case in point with what Department of Technology is doing with the IBM solution and what's, what's gone on, uh, healthcare services is amidst of, a, of an RFO that's been awarded here recently, that we're looking at cloud strategies, we're assessing how we can move forward in terms of other, whether it's a private or a public or a hybrid solution. So, uh, you know, we're slowly getting there, James, you know, to, to that end, uh, you know, at least from our perspective, so. <laughs> Um, I think it, Barney's right on, uh, you know, it is going to be a culture change that is needed. Um, I'm lucky to work at the lottery where we're kind of there already. We have adopted cloud uh, for our public website. We are going to Office 365. But it really is um, going to happen as, uh, you know, technology changes. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing with our technical staff is virtualization has made it much more palatable to them because it's no longer physical. And so, you know, we are getting to the point where those folks now understand it. They don't have to touch it and it's really still there. And, and, you know, it, it's one of those things that we have to start educating up. Um, so we've been fortunate, uh, you know, in the lottery because we are a, a very progressive, very fast-paced organization where we have to deliver, and we have to deliver quickly, uh, that we can take chances where um, some of the other agencies cannot. Uh, we have different rules. I mean, we still have to make sure that everything passed through all of the security, the CGIS certification, the ISO 27001, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera because we did have to go to our legal, we did have to go to our executives, we did have to say, here is how it's going to be done, and um, they had faith, and so we're there. But it, it, it'll happen, it's just gonna take some time. So, um, it, it's a great question, James, and uh, you know, we work with you guys quite a bit, so you know, you know we spend a lot of time thinking about how to, uh, you know, to kind of get over that hump and apply Google tools to COBOL. Um, <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in. Um, but, you know, if, if uh, I, and I've been retired just slightly longer than Joe has, but, uh, you know, I, I remember I've probably sat in every one of your chairs at one time in my career with the exception of, uh, you know, sort of the network um, uh, folks. But, you know, it, it, I'll, just, I'll just say what it feels like to me. Uh, you know, what it feels like to me is, you know, when Silicon Valley comes in, it feels like they're saying, you're broken, and I'm here to fix you. And, and I would say that nothing is further from the truth. What has actually been happening um, at, at that point in time in, with government is that 
we've wanted to make changes. We've wanted to be in innovative. We've wanted to do things differently, and, and we haven't been able to get the resources, or we haven't been able to characterize it in ways that the resources would, would, would flow. Um, so, so it feels a little bit like, you know, you're broken, we're here to fix you. And, and I don't think that that's the case, really, but that's kind of how it felt, it would feel to me. I don't know if, I, if it feels that way to you guys out there. Um, so, so what I would really like to see is an approach with, um, you know, I, I think the big opportunity that we have is, is going back to, um, you know, the, the digital natives. Um, who, who really do want to make a difference and they really do want to help. So you have to find, as, as uh, state level civil service, and maybe, maybe there's some city and county folks out there, you have to find a way to allow them to help you in ways that are not threatening to you and your team. And, uh, and I think that there's common ground there if you just look, but you have to find a way to, to do it so that, so that, so that we avoid this uh, you know, you're broken, I'm here to fix you kind of mentality. Very quick answer for James. I really need your autonomous car for highway patrol. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I don't think there's anything more Google needed to do because you touch us every day. We touch phone, we work on a computer, we do any, we go anywhere, we'll have Google there. We already know how good you are. You are the best company in the world. If we don't have anything so far, California stays with you, something's wrong. So we need to change our mindset. We need to move to the direction. We need to take advantage of the best technology in the world, just the backyard of us. So, Thanks. So but i just kind of taken a step back a little bit and kind of saying I, I read something the other day where it said that 80% um, to 70% view mobility as a top priority but less than 10% ha actually have a mobile strategy. So I think everybody believes that we need to be doing this, but if we really step back and really figure out what's our cloud strategy, what's our mobile strategy. Um, and, you, and no department's gonna let some CIO and their technical staff just go helter-skelter. You're gonna have to have a roadmap, you're gonna have to have a strategy and make sure it makes sense from a fiscal and from how you're protecting the citizens. I think the other thing, um, the gentleman from Cisco brought it up, the whole internet of things. I mean, I think we're at this point now of this perfect storm convergence where you look at mobility and the, and the networks and the smartphones and you look at the infrastructure and the ability to do kind of location-based intelligence and the whole cloud and social media. So you can't talk about mobility without talking about the internet of things. So I think we're, we're in the state sometimes, you know, historically it takes a little bit longer to react, but that's not a bad thing. But if you look at some of the interesting facts around mobility and I'll just kind of, and you probably know about this, but I mean, I think Shell brought this up. It's, it's, it's not about this anymore. I mean, you've got digital wallets, you've got smartphones, you've got eyeglasses, you've got all kinds of stuff, wearables. So anything that moves can be connected. Um, I think just between you and, and Apple have a little bit less than 2 million mobile apps that you can go out to your store and get. Um, there's like 3 billion devices connected now in the next three or four years, there's gonna be six plus billion and 85% of the people in the world are gonna be connected. And then I read someplace where there's more computing power in this than what landed in the Apollo 11 that landed people on the moon. Now I haven't tried to strap this to my back and take off, <laughs> but but, but I think if you look at everything that's kind of coming together and you look at, look at the convergence and you look at some of the, what Barney said, that what the Department of Technology is doing in the state policies on cloud first and software as a service, I think you're starting to see that momentum move forward. Yeah. And I think the perfect timing is now to get engaged and help us develop a mobile strategy and a cloud strategy. Yeah, so I, I kind of shivered in fear at the comment about being from Silicon Valley and being here to help. Um, and I'll give you my perspective, just, I mean, and I think people, there's a lot of amazing talent in Silicon Valley and we use, we leverage and partner with pretty much everybody there to provide services uh, to our, our sector in some way or shape or form and sometimes really successfully and other times acrimoniously. But, you know, during the recession, we eliminated podiatry services. So we no longer provide podiatry for Medi-Cal recipients, which is really critical. It, it, the people who have foot issues that can really uh, compound and become much serious, say this is about $20 million a year. Um, 
also during the recession, we were paying the uh, penalty for failing to have the child support system from 1997 up and running, which was a billion dollars. So we could have kept podiatry going for 50 years if we had somehow avoid, avoided having to pay this billion dollar penalty to the federal government for our failure to get this child support system up and running. So I think a lot of times we're really skeptical about um, you know, people kind of, especially aggressive vendors, with these very utopian visions about how things can happen because you know, we've been burned pretty, pretty badly um, in a time when we really didn't have much maneuverability and, and, it really, and you know, really felt it. And I think that pall is cast over at least a lot of the decision making, and it will be for a while. All right. Greg Deschmaker with Intel. Uh, I'll first maybe poke a little fun back at James. Uh, difference between a guy in the hardware business versus the software business. James, if we're going to really instill the confidence, you know, in government to uh, kind of go where you're, you were talking about, we need to make sure that they know it's the brain trust of Silicon Valley, not Silicone Valley, right? I, I think they'll they'll move forward faster. Thanks, Greg, for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to build on, uh, Lena, you, you touched on uh, some incredible things happening at a lottery uh, with your field force and putting mobility uh, and mobile devices in their hands, et cetera. But you then also touched on uh, a legacy problem, people using facts uh, still. And we see this, uh, you know, we, so we, we talk about the purpose of technology, not just mobile technology, but things like big data, the Internet of Things, uh, et cetera. But the, the promise of the, the great value of all this technology is only if we change culture, mm -hmm. processes, et cetera. Um, so the question is, what, are the, what do you see as the biggest challenges as we go through the next couple of years as it pertains to those non-technical issues around culture, policy, legal, et cetera? Is that, is that for all of us there, Greg? <laughs> yeah, good point. Excellent question. I think uh, as it relates to that, I think it's really about having an organizational change management solution in place. It's the shift, you know, as getting back to my comment about, you know, how we change and how we move and move towards technology to adopt these type of technologies that vendors and people like Google can bring to, uh, you know, our departments. I think it's really about having some sort of organizational as well as a strategy or, or, a, or a, you know, a strategy in place to how you're going to get there. What are the things that need to be done? Um, I think uh, Cisco talked about education. It's really about educating, educating our customers, educating our executives, you know, the, the folks at the top, at, you know, the directorate level, and uh, you know, ensuring that they know and understand as we move forward and as we try to adopt these new technologies, we're doing it for the, for the good of the organization. We're, go we're doing it to save money. Uh, let's face it, so, you know, there's a lot of good opportunities out there as it relates to return on investment and, and as we migrate from um, one type of technology to another technology. So, I, I, you know, from at least from my point of view, I think it's really about having organizational change management wrapped around your strategic plan. Uh, adding on to that, uh, so what I did at CDFA, so I'm actually responsible not just for IT, but also strategic planning and implementation. Um, so uh, a big project we have right now is workforce development. Uh, we're going to lose about 40% of our employees within the next three years uh, to, due to retirement and attrition. Uh, so we partnered with UC Davis, um, the, the extension program, and we have a series of six classes plus a capstone project. And the classes are focused not on IT. The classes are focused on implement, implementing strategy, change management, um, ethics, uh, the legal issues, um, things that leaders need to know and understand. And these folks, um, these 28 folks in the current program for this year will hopefully become our future leaders within CDFA. So um, we try to develop the whole person. It's not, in, t in working in technology in my group, it's not about taking a bunch of programming classes locally. It's about developing that whole person. Thanks. I'd like to add a little uh, to that. Um, one of the challenges that we have in government is we have to show transparency and we have to be accountable to the citizens and we have to be, you know, we're accountable to the public. And so uh, we, along with the 
culture change, it is going to be communication uh, with the executives and then communication outside. How is this still work? You know, um, as we're deploying uh, Office 365, one of the components is link. Okay, well, that education to executives about instant messaging, and really it's not that much different than email. We've got to be able to do that and show that there's still going to be the accountability. We're still, it, it, it's it, internal, so we still are able to manage it the same way that we do email, and it is just a different communication method. Um, we have to be very open with what we're doing, why we're doing it, and the return on investment. And so it all is going to take some time because um, it's not just the internal organizational communication, it's also that communication to the public. I'd like to add one, one comment real quick. I think, uh, uh, you know, as it relates to the communication and organizational change management, I think having that support uh, from the executives as well is, is crucial. Knowing, knowing that they're educated, and that they support your endeavors, I think that's very crucial. Fortunate for, for us at Healthcare Services, our directorate is extremely supportive of our IT initiatives as well too. So I think that is, is extremely crucial. Um, so that's a really good segue into uh, the, the kind of comments I was gonna make, which sort of fall into the general bucket of, uh, you know, my general pain in the ass kind of um, <laughs> view these days. Um, Everything that we're talking about here is uh, around innovation requires a tolerance for risk in the state of California, which I don't believe exists. So, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, Barney has a leadership team that supports him is great. But until uh, there's a greater appetite for risk and there's some reward for that risk, because there's absolutely no reward for anyone out there to take a risk at this point. Um, you know, you, you, you know, we're asking you to be innovative, um, and then we're slapping you when you are. Um, so, so until there is a greater appetite for risk in, in government, uh, I, I don't believe that organizational change management, and, and we're in that business, uh, you know, the, the organization that I work for, we do organizational change management all day, every day. Um, but, uh, but in government, until we get an appetite for, for, uh, for taking risks and reward the taking of risks, I really don't see a lot of change very fast. It'll be, you know, glacial like it's kind of been. Now, there are some opportunities, don't get me wrong, and you've heard me talk about them here today. Um, but, but I think we have to, you know, sort of take that back up and, and, and address that, that risk uh, because that's kind of what leads us to be micromanagers. Right, and, and until we get away from that, um, I, I don't see great gobs of innovation happening in the state. I think it's very difficult, um, and this is a challenge that I've had in my job putting together hearings. Um, in government, there isn't a lot of other areas where there is as much risk as there is in IT. So, you know, we're paving roads, you know, we're paving roads at Caltrans, we're not like, well, there's a 30% chance it might not work. I mean, you know, you don't say that. Like, you know, they, they, you have, you're used to things just being, you know, pretty, they just work, you know? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, for us is that it is hard to get your head around. And I think one of the things that we're trying to figure out is a way to, you know, get a, a tolerance for what should our risk tolerance be and how much uh, oversight and kind of, uh, barriers and hoops you have to jump through depending on your risk and trying to do something to look at that as a way to sort of examine what people do so that we're, we're kind of micromanaging where we should be and not micromanaging where we shouldn't. But it's really difficult to do because it it's a very uh, abstract conversation to have. And there are isolated. Well, there's there's more there's more and more of those coming up. Like uh, Federal Department of Health and Human Services has that Idea Lab. That's all about risk. And and just like Barney's environment, uh, you know, they are tolerant of that risk. But uh, you know, sort of overall, um, we have a long way to go. Yeah. 
Well, it's not just tolerance, though. It's it's having being acclimated to the level of risk. So if you're not used to risk being in your environment, and then all of a sudden it appears, it's it's pretty jarring. And I think that's the challenge: is there isn't a lot of comparative places in government to go. Well, it's just kind of like X. I mean, it's sort of a little bit like maybe criminal trials. You don't win them all, or there's, a, for example, the high-speed rail. We're building that, but we could get sued. I mean, there's a little bit of risk in everything we do, and frankly, the budget is all full of risk, all kind of, are we going to get this money, are we not, are we going to spend this much? It's all about risks piled on top of each other. But I think the, the challenge for us is that this is this one place where there is a really high uh, risk, and when there's a failure, it's pretty spectacular. It's the implosion in this grand scheme, and so it's hard for us to, like, get our heads around it. I think one of the things that's really going to help is that it, the legislature's term limits have changed and members can serve potentially 12 years. So most of my members that I work with now have the capacity to be there till 2024, 2026. So they'll hopefully, you know, have seen a couple things go around and see some successes and some failures and then they'll be a lot less, uh, you know, reactive to the risk. But it, but it's it's a real challenge for us and we just, it's not that we don't have risk tolerance, it's that we just are having a hard time kind of figuring out how to how to get the right amount of it. My name is Phil Lakely from NWN. And in a former life, I was in the financial services industry. So this is a great segue from the last comment about risk, because risk means different things to different people. So at every, different times in the budgeting process and how you manage procurement, there's always the capital expenditure expense that you're having to deal with on an annual basis and justifying and figuring out how you're going to pay for this next wave of technology and make it work. So my question is, maybe specifically to Christian, is the state opening its thoughts to as a service and finding ways to leverage some of the, spread some of the risk out over time by making things a as a service across the board instead of having to make everything a capex, capex decision? It's been on a case-by-case -case basis. I think we've done a little bit of that, but I think it's it really requires some vision and leadership for when that's appropriate, uh, because it, sometimes I think there's a um, I, you know a lot of issues about who when do we own what we're doing and when do we not own it, and that that's really complicated. And so we've I've seen us successfully you know go from having to operate you know our own. Um, standalone like server type things in every little department to consolidating those things to putting them on the cloud over time as people got more confidence uh, with the technology and they got confidence that they'd have control over their own data and they wouldn't have to worry about proprietary issues. But I think it has been something that is is been more like, you know, a leader in a particular agency or a leader in a particular department spearheaded as opposed to like a statewide phenomena because I think that vision really needs to be in the context of the of the business needs of the particular entity. So for CDFA, um, we, within the past year, implemented a cloud solution for our, our California Animal Health Emergency Management System. And it was one of these things that it made sense that we would put it in the cloud. It was so focused. Um, and um, we found leading vendors in this field that could easily do this and can demonstrate and prototype that before we even purchased it. So um, I, I think it's about finding what I call quick hits, uh, things that you can implement with uh, you know, perceived lower risk, uh, things that um, can be implemented within a you know, matter of months. Um, and, and from there, we can then develop that as a case study uh, and share that with others. And that's what I've been doing on projects. It's I complete a project, writing up the case study jointly with uh, the departments involved or the, the companies involved, and sharing that. Um, and, and I think that is um, going to help. I think your question was great. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, I would challenge you know some of the vendor com the com vendor community out there uh, as it relates to risk and as it relates to the software you know or, or as a service here that uh, you know it's incumbent to help us you know because we're you know we're while we are experts and we consider ourselves to be experts you guys are in it on a day to day basis so to that end you know helping us to be risk adverse and and, and helping us to put that strategy in place to move towards. You know, so, uh, services or you know, service-oriented solutions is is a perfect opportunity for us to keep moving down that path as we continue that change. Um, you know, healthcare services is, uh, in itself is uh, already engaged in about four to five different technological solutions in terms of a service. 
So we're, we're, we're starting to look towards that, for at least from a state perspective or department perspective, we are starting to look to, towards that because, again, is, uh, the, is the challenge, do we want to own it and maintain it and run it? And what's our, what's our return on investment? So we are, we are definitely moving towards that, you know, those kind of solutions. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Howard Bowen with the Department of Justice. Uh, I got a question, yep. and I got it written out, and I can't read it out. There it is. So you want to te you want to text that? Sure, I can do that. Um, so as mo mo uh, mobility matures and becomes more commonplace, and our dependence on mobile communications increases exponentially, a host of issues arise, especially in the areas of public safety and law enforcement relating to connectivity and service disruptions that occur in outlying areas throughout California. How are you addressing this issue and what solutions and technologies are you using or looking at to solve this issue? And whoever cares to uh, answer would be fine. Since you talk about law enforcement, um, the technology, because we are talking about a specific mobile or different uh, apps, different application, but we need to have a big picture. The future of uh, uh, internet, it is the service, just like a radio signal. You can go anywhere there is a connection. So FirstNet is the project funded by federal government, which provide Wi-Fi internet access anywhere, uh, anytime for emergency. But that will be expanded to other services. So we are looking for the future. Besides the uh, existing internet, Technology. We are also looking for microwave, and which is uh, in the process of building statewide. And also, high-speed rail will bring additional internet uh, highway because every uh, uh, railroad they build will have a very uh, fast uh, high-speed internet as well. So when we work on specific technology, we are looking for the big picture. We are ready. We are kind of build that piece uh, in our blueprint. So we. We cannot just continue to build silos. Uh, think about this is what we we can. And also, we talk about the um, future of internet. It's not internet anymore. It's internet of things. So, uh, what different things you can uh, link together provide uh, similar service uh, to our citizens, and also provide public safety. So, uh, I always always say, we we cannot drive along. Uh, uh, because the agency, one example is other state, uh, they already built their whole state, uh, Office 365. Think about it, CHP, we're trying to build a platform to share information with Caltrain. Mm -hmm. We are reinvented wheel, but we have no choice because we don't have a common shared platform. If the state, we say every agency, we are on one platform, then we don't have to build those interface anymore. We're already on. So uh, I think we, we need to keep reminding ourselves there is a big picture. When we're doing small thing, we, we need to build that uh, piece in our blueprint. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Um, before we conclude today's event, I want to give our panelists, uh, what a riveting discussion we've had today, but I would like to give them just a, a moment for any last words. Christian, we'll start with you, and we'll just come right down the road and end up here with Lena. Just final comments and thoughts for the audience. Thank you for a great discussion. Oh, yeah. Also, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks for the, uh, the other panel members. And, and what I enjoy about these events is I meet folks um, both from the vendor community and from the public sector that share the same problems. We may sh solve them differently or slightly differently, um, but it's great information sharing. Thank you. Well, I, I, I just say I would learn a lot from our colleague today. And uh, we, as I said, our resources are scarcity and we are not in the business to reinvent or to quit anything because we don't have to. So we just found an innovative way to use the technology. That will help us a lot. Um, I, I would say, um, aside from being in, uh, you know, the, the sort of, you know, movies and TV business where you always look at the award shows and they're always saying, I have the greatest job ever. You know, I get to go to work every day and have fun. You know, I always looked at technology like that. You know, technology is the coolest place to be working in the state, I mean, in my view. Uh, because, you know, everything changes so often. So I, I wouldn't want anybody to, to walk away today uh, from any of the challenges that we pointed out or any of the, um, 
uh, of, of the what look like uh, negatives about technology and take that to the bank and say, well, we're doomed or, uh, or, or something worse. Um, you know, look at those as challenges and know that the technology exists to solve them. You have to be open, but be encouraged because, you know, it, technology is just such a great thing. You know, there's, there's new pieces of it every day and, and, and embrace, uh, you know, the, the changes with it, even though, you know, my, my comment about COBOL notwithstanding. Um, you know, look for solutions. They're out there and people are, are there and, and ready to help you. And it's a great vendor community that, that is available to help you and, um, and, and, and don't turn your back on that civic uh, coding community. They are, uh, they are huge resources for you as well. So be encouraged. Uh, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate today. It's always kind of exciting to, uh, you know, I live in my own world with my own issues. It's nice to know I'm not as dysfunctional as <laughs> uh, that I've been led to believe. I also uh, want to talk to Mr. Google after this event because I'd like to talk more about that. Uh, I, I, I'm beneficial in the sense that I work in an organization that's not necessarily adverse to risk and we don't necessarily have the same number of controls that a lot of, their, a lot of other state agencies uh, get to benefit from. Um, my challenge from a cultural perspective is more, I love the, the startup mentality and I love the fact that there's people who come together with a dedicated purpose to deliver something of excellence. Uh, I think that's my biggest challenge. Technology is easy uh, at the end of the day if you assemble the right team. Uh, my challenge is assembling the right team and making sure that we're getting people with passion and desire and it's, it's not about a paycheck, but it's about uh, contributing to excellence and, and uh, it's, it's just nice to have opportunities to build these sorts of networks. So uh, hopefully that will be less of a challenge going forward. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I, I guess I just want to leave you with the thought of challenging uh, the modes of connection, right? Is it the person to person, person to machine, or machine to machine? And how can that help you in your day-to-day -day, uh, work in providing services out to the public? Thank you. Great, um, thanks as well. Um, you know, for me, change is gonna happen. And if you look at the education sphere right now, we have six million public school children who will be taking their assessment tests this year on uh, computers, mostly on mobile devices throughout the state. So the issue is really how we manage that. Um, do we have the political will, the public will to put dollars aside and resources aside to manage that transition? I think that's where we really have to focus our policy efforts. <clears throat> I too agree that uh, technology is the coolest place to be in the state. So uh, I would uh, I would encourage every one of you. Uh, healthcare services is hiring, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Uh, but really, thank you to NWN, thank you to the panelists here, and uh, we truly look forward to any opportunities we can. So thank you. From an NWN uh, perspective, this has been a great forum, and we thank everybody for your input. It's really nice to hear, especially those of us that don't get out much, um, the, the, the challenges and some of the, some of the things that we're dealing with on an everyday basis. It helps us. It helps us provide and develop applications and solutions that actually, uh, you know, fit better with, with your challenges. So it's nice to hear that. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. I, I would say um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's okay to borrow and, and steal. Take a look at what's going out there in the private industry from, from retailers, hotel, entertainment, transportation, medical, restaurant business. All these entities out there are probably leaps and bounds further than the, the, where the public sector is. So go out there and look at some of the things that they're doing. It's okay to extrapolate that and apply it to your own lines of business. All of us can probably look at ways to improve the lives of citizens and, and make services more convenient and assist those in needs. And also from a law enforcement standpoint, you know, defending against threats type of thing. So I would say go find yourself a true executive sponsor, a true business champion, and, and then latch on to that and you will be able to move forward. So thank you for the opportunity. And the one thing that I would leave all of you with is that at least at the department, we are looking to partner with those uh, vendors who understand the constraints that we have, 
to know that we do want to remove the barriers to you know our providers to to give the best care to our beneficiaries but also for the vendors to understand that we work within uh, a, a set of confines that sometimes require um, special thinking uh, may not be the most uh, crazy, innovative, you know, on the edge style of, of work, but we're getting there and we're getting there slowly and the momentum is building and, and, and if we have the right folks with us, I think we're going to get to the ends that we're hoping to achieve, which is the best health care in, in the country and setting a model for, for the rest of the state so they can learn from what we've done, the mistakes we've made, but also benefit from the successes we've had. Thank you all for coming to listen to, I don't know that I had very many words of wisdom, but uh, I appreciate being with this great panel. Um, one of the final thoughts that I have, uh, it is about uh, being open to questioning why are we doing things this way? Um, are there different ways that we could be delivering the same service or delivering the same message. Uh, so as long as we continue to reevaluate and uh, approach every day as an opportunity to just question wh why, um, is there a better way? Can we do this faster or better or more efficiently or more securely? Uh, you know, it is, the tools are out there. Um, I am you know, constantly amazed at what people are coming up with and, you know, just saving it away in the back of my brain thinking, ah, there's a nugget that I can use at some later date and the opportunity will come. It's just a matter of maintaining uh, the, the connection to what is the business doing, where are they going, and how do we help them do things better. Thank you, Lenia. Uh, join me in a moment to thank this panel for participating today. They were amazing. Thank you very much. I would also like to give a special thanks to NWN, our sponsor today. If you're looking for mobile and collaboration solutions, many of their team is here today. They also have a demo out front. I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. Last item that's of important, kindly take a few minutes and fill out your survey. An event like this just doesn't happen. It takes a lot of planning. Your feedback, I value. I'd like to hear from you what you thought of it and what you think would be good for next topics when we do other events, not only here in Sacramento, but around the country. When you fill out your survey, drop it off to Jenny. She has a Pete's Coffee and Tea gift card for a small cup of coffee, as well as a parking validation for you, okay? Make it a great day. And again, thank you for joining us for this forum. Good day. Let's give it up for uh, Mr. James Baker, huh?